All right, everyone. Well, welcome. It's 11.03. I know we've still got a few folks joining, but let's get started. Welcome everyone to our West Coast Hemp webinar. This is a deep dive into cultivation and production. Um, today is the second of our four part hemp webinar series. And like I said, today we'll be focusing on hemp cultivation and production. It's so great to have everyone here today. My name is Catherine Favor and I'm a sustainable agriculture specialist at NCAT's Western Regional Office in Davis, California. And just really quick, can everyone see my screen? Good. So for those of you who don't know, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, also known as NCAT, is a national nonprofit dedicated to helping people build resilient communities through local and sustainable solutions that reduce poverty, strengthen self-reliance, and protect natural resources. We have six regional offices and I work out of the Davis, California office. Today, we also have with us uh, Mike Lewis, who is a sustainable agriculture specialist based out of the Northeast office, and also Rex Dufour, who is the regional director of the Davis office. And we're so excited to be talking today about the on the ground details of growing hemp. We know that hemp has been a hot topic for the past few years since it became federally legalized, and we're excited to talk today about some of the specifics of hemp cultivation with the focus on production uh, out here on the West Coast in California and Oregon. So if you're in California and Oregon now, wonderful, but if not, stick around anyway because we'll be covering a lot of information that's relevant to growers no matter where you're at. So um, yeah, and we are honored to have a group of five of the nation's leading hemp experts. Let me get my PowerPoint working here. There we go. Uh, I'll introduce each of these speakers in more detail soon, but just a brief overview. Today we have with us Mike Lewis, who is a sustainable agriculture specialist with NCAT, Dr. Sean Lucas, a professor and researcher at Kentucky State University, Dr. Gordon Jones, an Extension Agriculture Faculty at the Oregon State University Southern Oregon Research and Extension Center. Dr. Katie Britt, a postdoctoral scholar with University of California Riverside Entomology, located at the Kearney Agricultural Research Extension Center. And Paul Murdoch, the owner of Corn Creek Hemp Farm. So just a run of show, a quick overview of today's run of show and some housekeeping. As a reminder, please keep yourself on mute. You are free to keep your camera on so that we can all see each other's faces if you'd like, but please keep your microphone on mute. Um, the webinar is being recorded and this will be available afterwards on our after website and on our YouTube channel. Uh, the webinar is gonna be long, about two and a half to three hours. So please, please feel free to take breaks as needed. And um, during the first half of the webinar, we'll be focusing on before you plant, so that's everything you need to think about before you start your operation, including understanding hemp's risks and lack of rewards, crop estimates and labor planning, deciding what type of hemp crop is best for your system, genetics, site selection, site prep, and the, challenging, the challenges of farming hemp organically. Uh, then we'll have about 15 minutes after that segment to go over questions. Please write your questions in the chat and my colleague Rex will compile them and we'll ask them once all of those first three presenters are done presenting. Then we'll jump into the second half of our webinar, which is going to be covering hemp agronomy basics. That's basically what to do once you've got your crop in the field. So this is everything you need to know about irrigation, weed control, fertilization, and IPM. And as part of that, we're excited to showcase a case study of Horn Creek Hemp Farm, Paul and Whitney Murdoch's amazing hemp farm in Southern Oregon. So we'll get to see what all of this looks like on the ground and what systems have worked for them. And then again, after that section, we'll have another 15 minutes of Q&A. So again, please ask your questions in the chat. Um, and we also, in the chat, you'll see we've put a link to a survey. Uh, this is a brief survey, just five minutes. Please take it if you can. It's a way for us to learn what topics and information you'd like to learn about in the future. Um, and like I mentioned, we have two more webinars in the series coming up after this. So um, if you fill out the survey, that'll give us an idea of what we can put in our next two webinars. Um, and yeah, well, we take feedback very seriously. So again, just please fill out the survey if you can. And a quick 
moment for sponsorship. We would like to thank the generous support of the Western Extension Risk Management Education Center. Um, with their generous support, we were able to put on this webinar and all the webinars in our series. Um, I also want to briefly mention um, that beyond just this webinar, we hope that you continue to call upon NCAP for your sustainable agriculture questions. NCAP manages the ATRA project, which is our sustainable agriculture program, and which is funded through a cooperative agreement with the USDA World Business Cooperative Service. We have a hotline that you can call at any time to get one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and to get help with sustainable agri agriculture related questions. So if you do have any remaining questions that we weren't able to address during this webinar, we do hope that you reach out to us. Uh, even if we don't know the answer to something, we'll point you in the direction and connect you with someone who does. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's begin our first panel. I'm gonna introduce our amazing speakers. So again, this first part of our webinar is called Before You Plant, and we'll be covering everything you need to know before you put your crop in the ground. And uh, we are honored to have with us today, Mike Lewis. Mike, as I mentioned, is a sustainable agriculture specialist with NCAT at the, Northern, the Northeastern Regional Office. After serving in the military, Mike began farming hemp as part of the Kentucky Pilot Program and became the first federally permitted hemp farmer in the U.S. since Prohibition. He has won numerous awards for his work in agriculture and farming, including the 2013 and 2014 Local Food Hero Award, the 2015 Wendell Berry New Agrarian Kentucky Colonel Award, the 2014 Yahoo People That Made the World a Better Place Award, and the Grist 50 Award. Mike is a leading expert on agrarianism, regenerative agriculture, farm safety, veterans in agriculture and local economics, and he has been recognized as a farm aid hero for his work with veterans in sustainable agriculture. He is also the president of the Hemp Industries Association, and he has done a ton of work to put this webinar on today. So thank you to Mike. We also have Dr. Sean Lucas. Dr. Lucas is a professor and researcher at Kentucky State University, where he and his research team conduct studies on diversified organic farming system, systems to help producers answer questions about developing best management practices for their operations. Dr. Lu Lucas coordinates a nationally recognized research program on industrial hemp at Kentucky State University, and research efforts have included study of the impacts of field reading of fiber hemp on soil quality, aquaponic production of hemp, investigation of varieties that perform well in organic systems in Kentucky, impacts of hemp in crop rotations, an examination of impacts of several biofertilization products on crop biomass, grain yields, cannabinoid content, and flower yield. And we also have with us Dr. Gordon Jones. Dr. Jones is an extension agriculture faculty at the Oregon State University Southern Oregon Research and Extension Center located in the Rogue Valley in Oregon. He holds a bachelor's of science in sustainable agriculture from Warren Wilson College and a master's and PhD in crop and soil environmental sciences from Virginia Tech. Dr. Jones conducts research, teaches extension classes and provides technical assistance around pasture, hay and hemp management, soil fertility, cover crops and pesticide stewardship in Jackson and Josephine counties and is one of the, hemp, the nation's leading hemp agronomy experts. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike who's gonna be talking about understanding hemp's risks and lack of awards. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be here um, with everyone. Um, as Catherine said, my name is Mike, and I'm a, a sustainable agriculture specialist. Uh, I work out of the Northeast office in King, New Hampshire. Um, but my family does um, live and farm at the um, western foothills of the Appalachian Mountains uh, in a small town called um, Livingston, Kentucky. Um, where we operate a small, uh, diversified, sustainable uh, farming operation. As you can see, I threw some pictures in here. We raised a little bit of livestock. Uh, we raised some produce uh, for local markets and also um, a lot of perennial tree crops. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I do have the privilege of serving as the um, board chair for the Hemp Industries Association, which is the um, nation's oldest um, Nonprofit uh, hemp specific trade association. Um, 
so I want to, this just talks a little bit about what I'm going to uh, cover today. I want to really quickly cover my history with hemp um, uh, and then uh, some challenges in the actual production of hemp. Um, I want to cruise into some whole farm planning. Um, and then I want to give some examples of uh, hemp in rotational systems um, and how we've used it on our farm. Um, and disregard the last note there on questions because that was a lack of um, understanding on my part. The questions, as Catherine pointed out, will be at the end. Um, so <clears throat> for me, um, like, um, like a lot of people, like a lot of the projects I start with, hemp actually started as a, as a pretty big accident for me. Um, a lot of people that work in this space have been working on it for decades. Um, but in 2013, I was working um, with our department on um, the development of a veteran label, which was the Homegrown by Heroes, which is now a, a national program. Um, I did, uh, not relevant to uh, today's question at all, but I did want to throw in there while I was mentioning the veteran piece that NCAT does very successful uh, veterans to agriculture intensive um, training program arm to farm and I'm sure if these um, presentations are shared I've, I've included uh, links to those um, in the actual image of the presentation <clears throat> excuse me um, but during um, that work in 2013 I was afforded an opportunity to speak before our um, state legislature and it was specifically about the homegrown by heroes label but I didn't want to miss an opportunity to present some of the challenges uh, facing my uh, community to our elected uh, officials and representatives. I um, live in what we call tobacco belt and um, for all of the ills associated with tobacco, there is uh, no denying that we had a system that actually worked for farmers and communities. And after the buyouts, the tobacco buyouts, most of the track in our local ag economies ended overnight. And so that was what I talked about versus talking about the, the veteran label to my legislators was the need for ag infrastructure. And after that presentation, our ag commissioner came over to me and said, hey, can you come back tomorrow morning um, and give a presentation about us trying to legalize industrial hemp in Kentucky? Um, and I, I laughed and I said, I don't know anything about hemp. Um, and uh, he returned my laugh with another laugh and said, I, I knew all I needed to know. Um, so I went the next morning and I, I gave a presentation. And 10 months later, um, my family became one of the, the first to legally plant a hemp crop since prohibition in, in the 30s. Um, my crop that year was um, a fiber crop in partnership with a, an organization actually out of California, uh, Fiber Shed. And it was used to blend um, our Kentucky hemp with Kentucky um, wool and domestic cotton. Um, it was a very successful project. I learned an awful lot. Uh, Dr. Lucas helped an awful lot. Um, and we successfully commercially blended the first um, fiber blend since prohibition of those. Um, so there's a link in there um, <clears throat> as well to the cloth project if you want to see some more, um, some more about that. Um, and uh, I do, I do want to note, though, at that point in time in, in Kentucky, Kentucky is um, very uh, Baptist, I guess would be the word. And uh, in, in 2014 and 15, it was still pretty common for my family members to accuse me of growing devil weed. Um, and it was uh, during that time that your next presenter, Dr. Lucas, and I managed to convince a, a bunch of nuns in uh, central Kentucky to grow hemp with us. So um, and I'll let you ask him for specifics on that um but some great research came out of that um so that's um basically how i got engaged in this um so i do want to talk about the struggles that's that's why i'm here hemp has always been a, a struggle for me um and i've highlighted what i think are some of the key struggles here uh, to talk with you about today the first is um what i call the oppression of opportunity right um there are so many um, potential, there's a sundry of uses for this crop, right? and, and you have to figure that out, right, as a producer. Are you going to grow for textiles? Are you going to grow for grain? Are you going to grow for industrial uses? Or are you going to grow for cannabinoids? Um, each of these crops, uh, they represent um, 
they represent and require different production techniques, different fertigation rates, different harvest equipment, and as you're going to learn a little bit more today, a whole lot of other things. So it's important, uh, one of the first things and first struggles that we had on our farm was understanding what is going to fit into our existing system. You know, a good example of that is if you're a grain farmer, you probably want to grow for grain versus trying to, you know, go for fiber or cannabinoids. Um, <clears throat> the next challenge um, that I've got um, in my notes is actually why we're here today. Um, finding accurate and factual knowledge is very difficult in this space. So I was very happy to see this put together. Um, and I do, I, um, you know, Catherine, I do want to acknowledge Catherine for, from NCAT for putting this together. Um, this is a really great place to start. Um, in my work at NCAT, I speak to two to four farmers a week, uh, at least about hemp. And half of them have been advised this plant requires no fertilizer. They should expect if a minimum, if any pressure, pressure from pests. Um, and I think the other really exciting is about this panacea crop is that you can pay your farm off in one season and still make hay wagons uh, full of money on top of that. Um, none of these things are in fact true, yet they persist in the dialogue. And these are still things that we as agriculture specialists have to overcome on a daily basis in this industry. None of them are true. It has plenty of pests. You're going to hear about that later. You've got somebody on this meeting that's got a PhD in pest management for this crop. So, um, you know, a lot of not truth, but I do want to say if you are um, one of those people that somehow makes um, wagons full of money, please don't, um, please don't forget the early adopters like um, Dr. Lucas and myself in your um, charitable giving. Um, <clears throat> another big um, concern that I, I would point out is the high cost of production if you're growing for cannabinoids. They're still I'm specifically talking about cannabinoids because the, the costs are exorbitant, but there still are some significant um, increase in costs for both grain and fiber because seed's still not readily available. Um, so the, the cost of production is a huge issue. I've seen, um, I've seen costs for transplants alone exceed $10,000 an acre. As a farmer, when you have that much invested in a single acre, you can only imagine how much extra time and inputs will be applied just to protect the initial investment. And, you know, add to that, I, I've got labor costs on here. Hemp is a really high yielding plant, and that is both a blessing and a curse, right? Um, the labor to remove the plants from the field and get them dried, get them stripped, can very quickly become an exorbitant expense in terms of, of manpower. Um, in fact, one of the things that, that we've learned early on is that we should not be chasing the maximum yield per acre if we're growing for cannabinoids, simply because it's, it's, it's more cost effective to chase that middle ground. Um, those two things directly uh, correlate to the next concern that I have down here on my uh, presentation, the marketplace uh, itself is is new and this industry still lacks standards um, and and more importantly clear policy you know over the past few years hundreds of farmers around the country um, have been growing this under contract but they still have crops from 2019 in storage and that is primarily because there's not a clear regulatory policy and the market is still somewhat immature so I would say if you are going to produce this crop you know you need to understand what it's going to take for you to produce it which you're going to hear a little bit more about here today but you also need to make sure that you know your buyer and understand the agreement in full there's no such thing as too much research um in, in this case especially when there's there's so much to lose um you know, most of the farmers I know that have those crops in storage had contracts with them. Um, <clears throat> there's also, um, you know, a significant number of challenges present when it comes to harvesting and, and post-harvest handling. First, 
Um, you know, there's not a lot of equipment, right? This crop hasn't really been grown on a large scale since the 30s, 40s, and 50s during, uh, during World War II. So when it, when it comes to that, the, the equipment needs to be fairly specific. And while we see new equipment and processes coming out in the space, it's still slow to, to gain traction. Um, so I, I've, I've highlighted some challenges from field to market here for, for each of the, the three segments of, man, I'm sure there's more segments, but the three segments that I identify um, here. And, and in terms of grain production, one of the biggest challenges that I continually hear from buyers is that getting airflow on this harvested material has to happen very quickly. Uh, some of the buyers and processors that I've worked with recommend within an hour of harvest. Um, other than that, I mean, I think that grain is, is pretty much grain. You're going to have some equipment issues because of, you know, this is a strong plant. There's a lot of lignans, and a lot of pectins and simple sugars in this plant that can bind up your equipment pretty easily. Um, <clears throat> all of that changes um, when we start talking about fiber production. Um, fiber crops represent a lot more challenges uh, simply because of, you know, the number one benefit of this plant, the size and strength of the raw material. This plant, the strength of this, this bass fiber, it's, it's really easy for it to bind top of the line equipment. I personally have witnessed a, a fiber crop bind up and burn out a, a brand new half a million dollar silage chopper in, in, a, in a matter of 30 minutes. Um, so, you know, the equipment is specialized and it's, it's not cheap equipment. Um, that's not to say that, um, you can't do it because we do it on our farm, but it's, it's much more uh, artisanal and hand scale, much like what you're going to see later today in, in the case study, with Mr. Murdoch. Um, and then we, we move into cannabinoid production. Um, and there's a whole other host of difficulties from, and, and from what we currently see in terms of production, it's very similar to tobacco production in the early 80s, which makes it very labor consuming, labor intensive, and time, and time consuming. Most of, um, most of your buyers are going to want to take possession of the raw material dried from 15% or less, and they're going to want it stripped from the plants. And while there's some you know, there is equipment and advances to assist with this, it's still very labor intensive. And the drying piece is, is critical as even the smallest bit of mold can lead to a, a, a giant um, issue of problems um, in producing this crop. When producing this crop, forgive me. Um, I, I have to say I was really excited um, when, uh, when Catherine sent over the, the, what she wanted me to speak on when I saw that uh, she had listed whole farm planning under, under my topic under my topics of discussion. This is a, a big focus with all of our um, specialists at NCAP. Um, most farmers uh, I know do an awful lot of planning, um, but whole farm planning is, is a lot different, right? It's more holistic. It factors in the family, the land, the crops, the community, the animals that live around your farm. It's, you know, it, it's about the whole approach um, and having a strong plan and a diversity of crops can, can really help create a significant amount of protection against um, unforeseen circumstances, whether those are um, derived from either market circumstances or if they're climate driven. Um, whole farm planning uh, <clears throat> helps me and, and many others outline and keep track of our personal goals. Um, it can help you reach your financial and sustainability goals. Um, and I mean, as, as you see from sort of where I'm going with this, the real goal is to improve the overall health of the entire farm ecosystem. And that includes you, your family, uh, and the community around you. Um, this, uh, this image to the right is, uh, I took that from the Virginia Beginning Farmers page, because it's a really simple outline of, of um, basic steps involved in the whole farm planning process. And I like it because it shows that it's a circular and continue process, right? It's always evolving. Um, you make a decision, you set a goal, you evaluate, you see what happened and you revise your plan if need be. Um, so if you're interested, um, 
in, in learning more about whole farm planning, I can tell you that, um, as Catherine mentioned, there are tons of NCAT specialists uh, throughout the country and lots of links on our websites um, that can help you. The reason that I felt that this was timely uh, for Catherine to include this in the discussion of, of hemp is that a lot of the farmers that I see and talk to that are coming into hemp are just starting out and they're, they're beginning farmers and they have this perception that hemp can exist and thrive in, in a monoculture environment, that they can just be a hemp farmer. And that's just simply, simply not the case. Um, <clears throat> people are, um, I'm gonna move into crop rotations and I, I've had an interesting year this year. People are always stunned when I, I tell them uh, how much hemp I'm growing on this farm, uh, on my farm this year. And, and the answer to that is none. Um, uh, not because I didn't have the desire or, or the will to, but because it was out of rotation. Um, if, if I had to pick one specific crop that we're trying to grow and nurture on our farm, it is our soil and the health of our soil and the creatures and microbes that live in that soil. And that requires a rotation of crops with rest periods. And this is one of the areas that really excites me about hemp um, because exploring its diversity in, in cover crop rotations is, is uh, there, there's a lot of potential for this plant, right? Um, like oats, I have uh, fall planted hemp and crimp rolled it uh, as a, as a no-till mulch, um, which I transplanted onions and, and leeks into the next spring. Uh, the onions and leeks were by no grand design. It was just what my uh, eight-year-old planted there before I figured out what was happening, but that's, that's what happened. Um, the, the herd, the, the woody fiber of this plant is primarily cellulose. So this crop has a potential as a huge soil builder in rotation. The, the cellulose acts very similar to a perlite or uh, vermiculite or something like that in, in a potting mix. It helps ret retain moisture and nutrients. So I see a tremendous uh, amount of potential for hemp in uh, cover crops as, as, as it becomes more commonplace and we see uh, more research uh, similar to what you're gonna hear about today with, with your experts later on. Um, I wanna go through um, really quick, um, I don't even know how I'm doing on time, but I haven't gotten flagged yet, so I feel like I'm okay. Um, so this is uh, not the best picture of my field, but uh, it does articulate the high cost of labor there to the left um, in production. But I, I put this image up here just to sort of talk through how this um, crop rotated on our farm very quickly. So this field right here uh, that my daughter is in and that edges up to my, my greenhouse there is about two acres. Um, in 2018, in the fall of 2018, that um, field was planted in a rye and clover cover crop. Uh, in the spring of 2019, we planted this field with uh, the 2200 uh, hemp plants that you see here. Um, these plants were under sowed uh, with a mix of uh, turnips, beets, uh, some clover, and probably a few other things that were kicking around, but those were the basics. Um, this hemp crop was harvested uh, late August. Um, some of the crop I, I still have um, in my barn. Uh, if anybody's interested, you can hit me up after. Um, but after the, the hemp harvest, <laughs> I'm kidding, I, I won't sell you my hemp. Um, after the hemp harvest, we moved, um, we actually moved three of our sows, uh, breeding sows, onto this field for about a week, let them turn over the soil for us. Um, and by the middle of September, we had this uh, field planted in a co winter cover crop mix of winter peas, rye, uh, daikon, radishes, some clover, and mustard. Um, in the spring of that, in the, in the spring of this year, um, half of that, in the spring of 2020, forgive me my timeline, um, in the spring of 2020, half of that field went into corn and beans and pumpkins, while the remainder was... Um, planted with our um, spring, spring market vegetable crops. Um, that half that had the spring vegetable crops in it is now planted uh, in a winter barley crop that we intend to harvest next spring. 
uh, after the, the barley harvest harvest in 2022 of next year, our, our intent is to have a 60 day hemp fiber crop followed by an overwinter cover crop. And then in, in 2023, this entire field will be turned into a, a dry bean crop. Um, so I hope I'm happy to, you know, share offline and then um, out uh, I know I, I don't I don't have the best uh, PowerPoint presentation skills. Um, so uh, there may be some questions about my delivery of that specific rotation, but I'm happy to, to talk about it more. Um, hemp has a, a, a lot of potential in your existing systems. And one of the things I like about it um, is the diversity that it brings, uh, that allows, it brings to me and allows me to think outside the box when I am doing that whole farm planning and trying to figure out how this crop can impact my, my triple bottom line, I guess. And I think I've got uh, some resources here for everybody. Um, and then uh, just a thank you. So how do I do, Catherine? Am I on time? Perfect. Thank you so much, Mike. That was so informative, and it it really is so important to get the 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 big picture about the realities, sometimes the harsh realities of this industry and where it's at, um, and the importance of whole farm planning and diversification. So, thank you. And um, again, we're going to hold our questions for uh, after Dr. Lucas and Dr. Jones present, uh, but keep writing them in the chat. Uh, and now we're going to transition into Dr. Lucas's presentation. So you are free to share your screen whenever you're ready. Um, so I'm, I'm going to come in and talk a little bit about my experience in hemp. Uh, Catherine asked me to specifically focus on uh, planning and a little bit of discussion about labor. Um, my wheelhouse is particularly organic hemp. Um, I have been working at Kentucky State University since 2000. 16, where I've coordinated a, a, an organic ag research program. Um, excuse me, my, my son turned off my power strip earlier. I told someone in the beginning that we would have interesting uh, issues with uh, with kids in the in the house during the <laughs> during Zoom meetings. But uh, but I'm presenting from home. It looks like my kid. I just got the low battery notice. I'm sorry. All right, I'll start over there. I I, I coordinate the organic agriculture program at Kentucky State University. Um, I got pulled into him. Mike Lewis helped pull me into him. I was a pretty willing, uh, <laughs> I was willing to get pulled in. I've always, uh, enjoyed, I've had an interest in, 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 in cannabis and hemp for a long time. In fact, you know, when I was asked to be part of this presentation, I was thinking about, well, there's plenty of indigenous cannabis knowledge on the West coast, uh, <laughs> particularly in California, you know, you think about, uh, Humboldt, Mendocino, and Trinity counties, but I, I think the reason I'm here is to maybe talk about um, fiber and grain and some some considerations that are particular to um, the hemp market space and the hemp legal space. Uh, just to give you a little bit of reference of what we do at Kentucky State, I mean, we worked a lot with uh, trying to find out what cannabinoid varieties work well in our particular uh, ecosystem in Kentucky, uh, and this is in an organic ecosystem. Um, so we're just looking at performance. It's a little bit different because we're probably a little more humid in Kentucky than y'all are in California, uh, or you know than folks are in Colorado. So you got to really consider the ecosystem variables um, and how hemp fits in. Uh, I've looked at hemp in organic rotations with uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, sunflowers, and I'm currently. Um, expanding outside the box a little bit, moving into what I, I guess I would call conventional uh, crop rotations. This is a non-organic research study that, that I am collaborating with University of Kentucky here uh, in the Bluegrass State. Uh, we're looking at hemp in an overall rotation and how it uh, facilitates ecosystem services. So uh, lots of stuff going on. Uh, I've dabbled in a few other things with hemp over the, over the last five, six years. Um, and as other folks have said, we've learned a lot about what not to do and, and, and a little bit about what might work. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit. Uh, a lot of y'all probably understand hemp biology, so I don't want to belabor this. It's a summer annual. It's, it's, it's usually photo period dependent, although there are what we call autoflower varieties. And, and autoflower varieties can play a, uh, 
can be kind of a wild card in planting. They are generally shorter season varieties, uh, harvesting 45 to 50 days, as opposed to, at least in Kentucky, we usually plant in May uh, and end up harvesting in you know mid-September, uh, late September. I'm um, getting ready to get my crew at the university out in the field probably uh, next week, starting to harvest some of our cannabinoid research trials. Um, but by photo period dependent, it's shorter days stimulate flowering. You know, the, the exact flowering dynamics are going to vary by variety. And then again, if you're using an auto flower variety, that, that is not photo period dependent. It, it will flower based on the amount of days in the field. Uh, usually, usually your crop is dioecious, which means you have male and female flowers on separate plants. Uh, but occasionally you do get uh, hermaphrodites and, and, and other wild cards. So in order to plan for a hemp crop, you really need to understand why you're growing the hemp. Uh, the big craze over the last, you know, four or five, six years is, is, has been cannabinoid production. And the reason for that is that, you know, people can jump right in in cannabinoid production and grow one acre, two acres, three acres, something like that. Um, and it's kind of manageable. Uh, until you get in and you realize how much labor it is to harvest, but uh, but but it's it seems manageable. Whereas if you're growing for fiber and grain, that's you're growing more commodity crop style. So if you're going to plan, you have to understand what you're growing for. Um, these pictures here show fiber and grain. Uh, that's my colleague Kevin Gertowski. He's an extension agent at Kentucky State University. He stands about five foot nine, so it gives you a sense about how tall those fiber plants are. Um, on the right is a grain crop. Those plants are only about two or three feet tall. Uh, you know, they've been bred to be suitable for combining in an ideal situation, although we'll talk about some limitations to combining uh, here in a little bit. And then we have cannabinoid, right? Uh, this is probably what a lot of people are thinking about. Um, I would encourage people to think beyond cannabinoids and, and look at fiber and grain as potential options, uh, just because the cannabinoid market is so volatile. Uh, the flip side is that, as Mike mentioned earlier, the infrastructure is not necessarily developed yet. Um, it's still developing for fiber and grain production. So, uh, just to get into a few basics, if you're going to plan, you got to kind of know what you're you're growing for and, and how you're going to grow that. So we know fiber and grain um, are, are different. The way we grow them is different than the way we grow a cannabinoid crop. And we'll get into the specifics here in a minute. But fiber and grain, you know, generally speaking, what we found here in Kentucky is that it responds to nitrogen fertilizer, as Mike alluded to earlier. People think, oh, we could just plant this stuff on rocks and it's going to grow. That's not true. It needs a bit of a care, right? So you, you got to fertilize. Um, seeding rate really depends on what you're doing. So again, planting depends on what you're going to do with the crop. Uh, fiber is usually about 60 pounds an acre is what we've been using in Kentucky. Um, and I like seven inch rows. Uh, grain, a little bit less on the seeding rate. And I also like seven inch rows in grain. I find that in organic systems, if you, if you plant at a wider spacing, you really end up battling the weeds uh, and your hemp does not have the opportunity it needs to be successful. Uh, so I like to get that canopy closure in uh, earlier with a, a narrower row spacing. Uh, what we found in Kentucky is planting depth is huge. Uh, you know, anything deeper than a quarter inch and you might run into germination issues or issues with your weeds uh, germinating ahead of your desired crop, your hemp, and your weeds will outcompete your hemp. Uh, and again, this is particularly true in organic systems. Um, germination is best between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it'll tolerate a little warmer and a little bit colder. If it's a little colder, obviously it takes longer to germinate. If it's a little warmer, you know, you get up around uh, 85, and I found that it does not like to germinate very well, at least in our Kentucky soils, which are sometimes a little bit on the heavier side. We have a lot of silt loam soils in the bluegrass region of Kentucky. Um, and so I, I, I've, I've had experience, I've experienced trouble getting hemp to germinate up above about 85 degrees in our soils. For us in Kentucky, you know, uh, we're on a little bit different, we're in a, in a, in a little bit different ecosystem than you all have in California. I guess it kind of depends on where you are in California. 
you know, for us, middle of May is 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 ideal for planting. Uh, early June, you can get away with. Um, and for cannabinoid varieties, if you're starting in the greenhouse, you can get your transplants out, uh, you know, later. But for fiber and grain, we like to put those in in uh, mid-May to early June. This is the uh, actual planting equipment I use at Kentucky State. Uh, it's a no-till pasture planter set on a seven inch spacing. Uh, and we just barely feather those coulters into the ground so that we can get a quarter inch depth. Uh, and there's your obligatory uh, tie-dye t-shirt. When you're planting hemp, you gotta wear something funky. So uh, plan ahead. This is our fiber crop from 2017 planted using that uh, pasture planter. Uh, pretty good stand there. Uh, I've seen, you know, iffy stands if people get planted too deep. Um, on August 7 or on August 21st, this was back in 2017, the crop looked really yellow, but that's not because it was nitrogen deficient. That's because this picture was taken underneath a uh, solar eclipse that happened on August 21st, 2017. And so it gave us some funky light. Um, for fiber, you know, the labor that goes into fiber really comes in. Um, you can, you could, you can, you can accommodate a lot of the labor with appropriate mechanization, right? We're using standard farm implements there, right? A, a, a no-till pasture drill. Um, if you get it seeded well uh, and you get good germination, um, you'll still get some weed pressure, but that canopy closes up pretty quick. Um, and, and, and it tends to take care of your weed issues. I find that if you have a bigger field with fiber, uh, you get more uh, germination success using the implements that we have on the farm. A lot of our smaller research plots, we actually run into germination issues because we don't get the run, runway length, I guess you, you could call it, uh, that we need with the, uh, with the planter to really get it going. Uh, that's, that's kind of a problem that might be unique to research plots, but on a, on a larger scale, uh, you're, you're probably okay. Um, generally though, you know, fiber, you could think about harvesting a little early, uh, earlier than you would grain or, or cannabinoids, that is. Uh, you could usually harvest fiber when about 20 to 30% of your males are flowering. Uh, I'll show you a picture too of what males look like here in a minute. Um, but basically once you start seeing those flowers being produced, the plants are not going to get much taller. And, and that's the goal in, in fiber production is to get tall stalks so that you can get your maximum amount of fiber out of those stalks. So once you start seeing the flowering taking place, the plants are putting more energy into producing flowers and they're not going to get much taller. So, you know, if you're seeing 20 to 30% of males come out, start flowering, and they tend to flower earlier than female plants, then you can start thinking about uh, harvesting. Here in Kentucky, a lot of folks mow and, and bale. There's a round bale. Um, you know, we have a lot of, you know, we have in Kentucky, we have uh, the biggest cattle herd east of the Mississippi River. Uh, I think we have about 300,000 head of cattle. Uh, and so we do have a lot of um, haying and, and rolling, you know, bale making infrastructure. And so farmers here are taking advantage of that. And uh, when they're growing fiber, uh, they, they tend to roll it and bale it. Uh, there is some specialized equipment coming out now. Uh, you know, that's a pretty expensive combine though. Uh, and I don't know too many beginning hemp farmers that are going to uh, be able to afford that. This particular uh, model is, is dual purpose. It's harvesting the uh, flowering tops of the plant to extract cannabinoids, and then it's collecting the stalks down below uh, for fiber production. One of the things we've worked on, Mike alluded to it uh, when we were working with Fiber Shed, is we were studying uh, the impacts of field reading of hemp on soil health. Uh, Mike and I just uh, submitted a manuscript to Soil Science Society of America Journal on the results of this study. Um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this uh, this presentation, but if anybody's really interested, I'll be happy to send you some information offline about that. Um, but this is the traditional process of, of separating fiber from the stalks, um, and it involves partial decomposition in the field. Uh, this picture down on the lower right shows you the, the, the bast fiber kind of peeling away 
from the cortex of the stalk, the pith, if you will. Um, and we've got a couple pictures there of us conducting the research on the, uh, the redding in the field. For grain, uh, you know, you need to think about harvest uh, when your seeds are at about 70% maturity. It's really a dicey situation because unlike corn and wheat, um, hemp is, has not been bred to hold its seeds. You know, when we think about a corn ear or a head of wheat, those plants have been bred to retain those seeds on that ear or in that head. Hemp still wants to shatter. It still wants to disperse its seeds. And so once it reaches a certain point in its maturity, um, your, your seed bracts are gonna be dried up, your seeds are gonna be mature and they're gonna start falling. And a lot of times the birds are gonna eat them and carry them off too. But if you, if you, if you wait too long to harvest, uh, you're gonna roll through there with your combine and your seeds, more of your seeds are gonna end up on the ground that's gonna end up in your hopper. Um, and so you've got to really learn what the sweet spot is. If you, on the flip side, if you harvest too early, uh, you know, hemp is a fibrous and very sticky plant and you can really gum up the works uh, in your combine uh, if you are, are not careful. So again, your production strategy when you're planning to grow hemp, you got to think about what you're growing for. We talked a little bit about fiber and grain. Cannabinoids are a different ball game, you know, Fiber and grain, we don't care if there's male plants out there. And in fact, if the, you know, if you're growing for grain, you ain't going to have grain unless you have males out there, right? We need the males and the pollen to develop the seeds. Uh, for cannabinoids, people are not interested in having male flowers in the field. So if they're starting from seed, they will rogue out or cull all the males from the field. Um, if they're starting from feminized plants, very often they'll end up roguing out the males because the feminization process is not a perfect process. Uh, and, and if they're growing from clones, then that saves a lot on the labor side. So if you're doing that math uh, of, of where your labor is coming in, particularly in a cannabinoid crop, this, this practice of having to get rid of all your males takes a lot of field scouting and, and looking at each plant and watching the flowers develop and pulling the males out. A lot of people like to come in from uh, vegetative cuttings uh, of known female plants, uh, and that does save a fair bit on the labor side. Uh, you know, the goal here is to produce flowers, flowers from female plants. That's where your cannabinoids have the highest concentrations. Uh, we really need to be careful in our planning to pick varieties that uh, are closer to, you know, 0.3% THC. Uh, I'll show you some data here in a slide or two. Um, that, that uh, will give you an inkling of why we need to be careful. As I mentioned, we can grow on smaller acreage than fiber or grain, but it is a pretty labor intensive uh, production. Usually, you know, people are starting seed indoors for cannabinoids in Kentucky. We'll start as early. This is actually a little out of date, you know, this, this April. We used to think April when we get them in. Um, I've started them as early as, you know, mid-March uh to transplant out in the field by may or june um and i've i've actually started them in late april and gotten them out in the field in july and and the difference there is just you know you you have less time in in uh in your vegetative growth stage and so your plants will not get as much biomass if you get them out later in the growing season because as soon as that day length does start shortening they're going to be triggered to go into flowering uh and then that's where their energy is going to go <clears throat> Spacing really depends, you know, if you're outdoors, uh, three to five feet within the row, uh, usually six to seven feet between rows seems to work pretty well. Um, I say three to five feet, uh, if you're growing from female clones, you probably wanna end up on the five foot end of this range. If you know you're gonna be culling some plants out, you know, you can start out at that three foot range anticipating that there'll be about 50% of your plants coming out and forming nice big gaps in your, in your rows. Uh, as I mentioned before, feminized seed and clones can cut that labor uh, of, of figuring out the males. But again, if you're using feminized seed, I have not seen feminized seed that I would call satisfactory yet. Um, some people claim they have 90%, 95% feminized seed. That still means you're going to have 10, 5 to 10% male plants out in the field. And so you still got to do that color, or you got to do that walking the field, scouting your plants and culling the males out of the field. 
This is an early female flower. Uh, you can see the, the uh, pistils coming out, the little white hairs that indicates it's a female. Uh, and these are early onset male flowers. How am I doing on time? Am I over? Just maybe two more minutes. All right, we'll skip through some of these. I do want to, I'm going to skip through. I, I got some pictures of harvest and stuff in here. This is some of the work we've done uh, in Kentucky. I will say that in Kentucky, we have been pretty good at using established infrastructure for our hemp crops. Uh, you know, this is a picture uh, from a friend of mine, John Emerson Smith. He is actually involved in the Kentucky Hemp Association. Um, he's been growing hemp for a few years now, uh, and he's repurposed his old tobacco barn. The picture on the left is him hanging tobacco in the barn a couple years back, and, and he's repurposed that for hanging his cannabinoid crops to dry out. Collecting the flower can be pretty labor intensive. Uh, this is stripping the flower off of the uh, stalks if you're growing for biomass. All right, so I mentioned market considerations. You got to plan ahead for the market too. The market has not been in good shape since 2019. Uh, in 2018, you were looking at about mm, between three and four dollars a pound if you had a 10% CBD crop. And by, uh, by January of 2020, that had gone down to about uh, 50 cents a pound for a 10% CBD crop. A lot of farmers had barns looking like this, which is bags full of biomass that didn't get sold. Some of them ended up dumping the crop on the ground. Um, and so you never plan for stuff like this, but uh, this stuff happens and it's, it's not fun when you're involved in it. It's an expensive compost in this guy's high top. Uh, as of 20, so that was 2020 data, 2021, if you look at the first lines in this slide, uh, this month saw continued erosion in the wholesale hemp cannabinoid product prices. Observe rates for Delta 8 distillate have resumed a downward trend. Smokable CBD flour, and by the way, Delta 8 and smokable CBD flour, I, I shouldn't even talk about that. We're not allowed to do that stuff in Kentucky, uh, but, uh, but we can produce biomass. Anyway, the point is the market's pretty uncertain yet. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide and get to this one. Uh, when you're planning, you really got to think about your varieties. Um, these are some varieties that we grew at Kentucky State, did some research on these. And what we really found is once you get up around 8% uh, CBD, your plant is going to be pushing that 0.3% THC threshold. And so when you are planning uh, to harvest, I recommend to producers to do spot testing in the run up to when you think you're getting ready. You might have to send a few samples off to a testing lab and monitor that CBD to THC ratio, they, they increase linearly and in proportion to one another. So the more your CBD you have, the more THC you're gonna have. Uh, so you really gotta be careful, do your homework on varieties. All right, so my take home points, you know, when you're planning is start small, uh, plant what you can afford to lose. Hemp is still a little bit of a wild west crop. Uh, lots of legal issues that are still being ironed out and the market issue is still being ironed out. Uh, you know, develop, a relationship with people that you're thinking about buying seeds and clones from. Uh, there's some trust issues that need to be established there. Uh, you know, if you don't know the biology of the plant, obviously you want to learn it. I come at things from a holistic point of view. And so, you know, as Mike mentioned really nicely earlier, um, you got to think about hemp as it fits in your whole system and in conjunction with all of your other management practices. Build your soils, feed your soils to feed your crops. Um, and, you know, if you are growing cannabinoid in particular, but it, it, it goes to be said for all the different scopes of production, you know, it's good to have a market lined up before you put a seed in the ground. Uh, and even then, you have to understand that a lot of the contracts that I've seen issued over the last couple of years were contracts that didn't get honored and the farmer got left uh, holding the bag, so to speak. So it's a, it's a risky crop. We've got a new fact sheet out, uh, KSU, and I'll be happy to share this uh, with people if you email me privately. Um, or maybe I could share it with Catherine and she could share the link. This is uh, for cannabinoid production. And that's it. I will answer questions in the panel at the end. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Lucas. That was hugely informative. Um, and it's really neat to see everything that goes into not only CBD production, which is what we largely do out here in California, but also seed and fiber. And there is a lot of potential for those markets in the future. So thank you. And now we will have Dr. Gordon Jones present. 
All right, let me get all my Zoomy tidbits sorted out here. I believe that you can see a uh, slide in front of you that says uh, planning your operation part two. Um, so let's just uh, dive into this that, um, uh, so I think about in, in Southern Oregon where I'm located, and this is a hot spot for hemp um, in both Oregon and probably in the country. I think generally about four different uh, sort of products, harvestable products uh, from hemp. We've heard a little bit today about seed and uh, fiber production. And then uh, previous presenters were lumping together cannabinoids. I split those apart. Um, we've got two types of hemp, one that is grown for smokable flour um, and the other that is grown for biomass, for extraction, for oil. And in Southern Oregon or in Oregon in general, these are our two crops. Um, I think there may be one seed grower in Oregon. I believe there are no fiber growers. Um, and so there certainly is a, uh, is and likely will be a future for those um, harvestable products. Um, for me to spend a huge amount of time focusing on it is really making up what those systems would look like. And um, just, just uh, we don't know yet. And as previous presenters have said, this is a fast changing industry. And so a lot of what I will talk about is a snapshot about what we see occurring in growers in this region um, and the weaving together some of the science we have both like basic agronomy as well as, um, as, well as hemp specific uh, research. And I've got a whole slew of sort of like before the season kind of topics and I'll just work through those. But I wanna talk a little bit about uh, risk and the challenges um, or potential lack of rewards in growing hemp that in terms of folks got really excited about growing biomass. It is a, um, seems like it's potentially a really valuable crop. And if there are, if there's good demand for CBD oil and various food or pharmaceutical or cosmetic products, uh, could be great. Uh, turns out that didn't, that did not shake out in the way that, uh, folks hoped it, folk, hope, folks hoped it would over the past several years. Uh, so we go to the internet and we can read about the U.S. Uh, hemp oversupply being 135 million pounds or um, folks questioning their strategy and shifting and trying to think of options on what, what do we do instead. And as Sean said, um, every grower that I go and talk to still has 2019 crop in the barn or has 2019 crop in the compost pile. Um, we can grow it way more easily than we can figure out how to sell it. And um, when we look at those kind of like um, market prices and ask questions about what is the market, um, I guess I, I would encourage folks not to think about it that way. The market is like solely on you as a producer. You get to build and create the market as you want it. We can find uh, folks who will quote various prices uh, per pound or per, per percentage of CBD per pound. Um, I struggle to come up with the buyers who will actually buy it for those prices. Uh, to my mind, this is like, I don't know, growing uh, blue goji berries. Is there a market? Uh, if you create it, someone will probably buy it. But should we expect to go to the grain elevator or to the co-op and have someone want to take it off our hands? No, um, doesn't work like that. Um, some folks up in the Willamette Valley put together an enterprise budget over the past year and I got to review this. And as they look at sort of this, uh, final um, returns over the total cost per acre. Um, they're living down here in this bottom uh, right-hand corner on spending thousands and thousands of dollars per acre to get the crop established. Um, and even within their estimates of, and they're growing for biomass here, even within their estimates, you've got to have pretty high yields and pretty high prices to make any money at all. And um, that seems, seems about right. Um, and so based on those two things, uh, this next graph that I'll show you should not be too much of a surprise. Here are registered acres of hemp in Oregon over the past mm, seven years. Um, hemp was legalized federally at the, in the 2018 Farm Bill. And so our 2019 crop was the first one that was, um, was federally legal. And we saw a explosion, a gold rush, like I probably will never see again in my career in terms of uh, interest in a brand new crop and a dramatic change in our landscape. And uh, because of the challenge with markets, because of oversupply, because of the economics of the operation, uh, this uh, diminution in acreage that we've seen over the past several years 
um, is not unexpected. And when I say that the industry is changing fast, like this is what I mean, that we're still figuring out what it means to grow hemp sustainably um, in Oregon in that um, yeah, kind of way. And so a little bit on uh, selecting seed and selecting seed particularly with uh, CBD, either um, cannabinoids for extraction, that biomass market or smokable flour in mind. Uh, I turned to the folks at Cornell, they've done some better variety trialing out there than we've done here on the West Coast. Um, look at a bunch of varieties. I'll show you a little bit of data from uh, 2020. Um, you can find this report online. Um, they looked at a panel of, I think, 32, what I'll call varieties. They're not varieties in the traditional sense. Um, exactly how they drew this collection of strains of hemp. I don't quite know. I assume it was not like randomly drawn and it's also not comprehensive. But if I look at these 32 varieties and pay some attention to the total THC column, because if you hit that uh, regulatory 0.3% total THC limit, really don't care what else you've done with the crop, what it looks like, what it smells like, how much CBD it has, you get kicked out of the system. And so uh, if 0.3 is our threshold and in Oregon we're allowed to, uh, ODA will round us down from 0.34 and call that acceptable. Um, we see that a majority of the varieties test hot by the end of the season. We've got some varieties that are between that 0.3 and that 0.34, which I'd call like really marginal in terms of being too hot come the end of the season. And only a few of these uh, strains or varieties uh, stay below that 0.3% uh, percent to percent total THC limit. And, and so if we're thinking about the risk in selecting seed, uh, this is a big risk that, that should be on our mind, is how do we select seed for a crop that will not become hot and get us uh, kicked into, a, uh, into a, a bucket of crop failure because of regulatory reasons. Um, I feel like each year since 2019, the seeds on the market are better. There are fewer um, sort of like nefarious or troublesome or unscrupulous characters uh, selling seed, and we're uh, winnowing out a a seed production industry that is um, somewhat better, but it's a relatively small group of uh, seed producers uh, based in Oregon and some in Colorado that folks are, are growing uh, currently. And I guess one comment on uh, being worried about high uh, THC, one of the other cannabinoids folks are um, interested in is CBG, uh, cannabigerol. And due to the like metabolic nature of cannabinoid accumulation, uh, CBG varieties will not accumulate high levels of THC. Um, and so are an option if folks are worried about, um, worried about that THC limit growing a CBG crop, um, maybe a viable option. But again, you've got to find somebody who wants to buy that CBG crop from. Um, on a little bit to soil and site selection, um, we turn back to folks in Iowa and what is this, 1947, um, where they were growing uh, grain and fiber hemp and not totally a clear picture, um, but their sort of like main comment that appears in the first paragraph of the first page of this document is hemp does not grow well in wet, poorly drained soils. Um, we can grow hemp in lots of situations, but like any crop, it will grow better in better soils. Uh, deeper, more fertile, well-drained soils. Here, their, their comment is that these soybeans in the foreground uh, through the same like sort of low place in the field are doing all right, but in that mid-ground where the hemp is growing, this is good-looking hemp in 1947, and this is no hemp at all because it's a wet spot in the field. Find the same thing here in Southern Oregon. This is, I think, a 2019 picture. Uh, this is one of the better, more consistent-looking hemp fields we had in that first, uh, first year. The wet spot in the field, you can see tire tracks there and probably also some sedge or rush growing. Um, plants did not grow at all, um, but outside those wet patches, they grow all right. And so um, looking for fertile soils, looking for well-drained soils are really the keys, um, and that's not new information. Um, other things on site selection, uh, some of this I bring up because uh, many of the folks growing hemp in our region are reasonably new to agriculture, have done maybe gardening, maybe have grown marijuana in the, their basement or something. But in terms of field scale agriculture, um, are new to it. Find uh, folks growing on marginal soils and sloped soils. Uh, 
lots this is gets me to like pull over and jump out and take a picture where are going on a reasonably steep hill for for our part of the world and have set their rows of um hemp up and down the up and down the hill and if we know a little bit about conservation agriculture that would not be a good practice and have like show show this a year or two ago as me feeling concerned about erosion and then drive back by again this spring and winter and spring are our wet seasons and i find the soil has washed off of that field uh into the ditch by the road and this is both like not a sustainable practice and that's like the light fraction of soil will be the 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 good bits of uh, organic matter that are washing off and it's also against our water quality protection laws uh, in oregon and folks just don't necessarily know uh what what they should be doing as they scale up into this size of operation we do have folks who can figure out how to plant along the contour and i think that, that is a, a wise activity um Another consideration that is on my mind where we've had a diverse history of agriculture in the Rogue Valley, including um, more than a century of uh, tree fruit orchard production, it's primarily pears now, but have grown tree fruit here for a long time, is the potential that there's stuff in the soil from previous activities that may be of concern to a hemp crop. Hemp is on the list of plants that are, um, are called phytoaccumulators uh, or bioaccumulators. Here's some paper they were saying that when, when they review the literature, hemp is a viable crop for a um, phytoremediation to pull things out of the soil, heavy metals, organic compounds uh, that you're trying to clean up, you might use hemp to do that. Um, in the world of um, hemp for sort of consumable products, um, we should have some level of concern about those um, heavy metals and other material. And here's a uh, newspaper article of a, of a recall for of um, hemp or marijuana for heavy metal contamination. And back in 2019, when we were seeing the pretty wild gold rush, um, this is another like pullover and trespass a little bit to take a picture. Somebody has gone into an abandoned uh, pear orchard here, cut, the, cut all the branches off pear tree, didn't have time to pull the trees out, and set some like really scraggly hemp starts in the ground. Um, haven't heard a huge number of cases of failed uh, pesticide tests or failed um, heavy metal uh, tests is something that is on my mind and is of concern, particularly as we're um, thinking about places that would have been treated with a whole broad set of uh, pesticides over the past century. And there was a time uh, a number of decades ago that the pest control for an orchard was lead arsenate. And when you have lead and arsenic in your soil, they really do just stick around. And uh, we can find studies of hemp pulling those materials out of the ground. Um, and so set that aside in terms of uh, site selection. Once you have found a site, we wanna do some evaluation like you would do for any crop. They'd ask me to review uh, soil testing here briefly. Um, I will do that very briefly because this is really no different than any other uh, crop. We need to collect a representative sample of soil out of that field. Um, you can find instructions probably from ATRA as well as your local land grant on how to do this. We can submit it to a, a testing laboratory. We need a testing laboratory that is using appropriate methods and once calibrated to the soil in our region. If we like zoom out and look across the country or the world, there are lots of different ways that you can test soil, different sort of solutions, extractants that can be used. We just really need to fit one to the, uh, the type of soil you have there. Um, and so look into your land grant university for assistance in doing that is probably the right maneuver. And then you need to um, have something to compare against. You need to have a set of like normal values or expected values. I don't know that these have been well uh, developed for uh, hemp anywhere in the world, um, but we do have sort of like standard values that are applicable across lots of different cropping systems and are probably the right starting place. Um, I don't know that there are any like best soil testing laboratories, but I do sometimes run across people who send them to like bad laboratories that we've got a guy in the region who like sort of operates out of his basement and does a little like at home test kit that can give you like high, medium or low for various nutrients. And um, when those kind of people, uh, when people come to me with those kind of test reports, um, they're really uninterpretable. And so having a, using the right testing laboratory, the right methods, then mean you can correspond those back against um, expected fertilizer responses. Um, just got some test results back that was from a you know, survey of farm, five farms across our, our region. This just got sent to me a couple of days ago. Um, let's see, I think my slide is a little bit squirrely here. Um, 
we know some things like soil pH. Um, most plants are going to want soil pH between six and seven. We should assume that uh, hemp is about the same. When I see pHs that are in the low fives, we know that things like phosphorus will become less available. Um, this is like soil fertility 101. Same thing with uh, as pHs creep high, um, start to worry about uh, the sort of tying up remobilization of nutrients in the soil. Um, and while this soil testing lab will give these like sort of high, medium, and low test values, um, I really prefer to use the sort of well established university guidelines. We've got a good Oregon State University um, uh, soil testing interpretation guide, and that would be my go to rather than relying on. Uh, relying on the testing laboratory, um, but really is not much different than any other crop. Um, plant spacing. We see, a whole, we see a whole range in terms of plant spacing and how this gets done. Uh, here are two like sort of better looking fields that have pretty um, different uh, plant spacing. Uh, on the left-hand side, we see a full season uh, day length sensitive crop that's on a four foot uh, spacing within the row and rows are spaced six feet apart from each other. This is pretty common if I were to give like sort of one standard spacing for, um, for a full season hemp crop. Um, and then again, on my like sort of like cruising around the county this spring, saw this interesting directly seeded auto flower hemp where they planted it with a grain drill, um, got planted early, was probably in the ground in April and uh, have a pretty tight plant spacing. And that's partly just because the um, autoflower plants are just gonna be small. They're only a couple feet tall versus uh, many, many feet tall. And, um, and so, yeah, end up with different number of plants per acre. And I was doing a little bit of brainstorming on sort of thinking about plant density because we see people shifting year by year and exactly how they space out their crops. Uh, to my mind, if I'm, oops, um, if I'm in a higher density system where I'm gonna like sort of really pack plants in so they grow up to be shoulder to shoulder with each other, um, we should expect to have more uh, yield per acre. Um, we should have those plants will become competitive with weeds. If you grow to use all of the light that is in the system, there won't be that much light left over to grow weeds. If you wanna walk through those fields to scout for insects or disease or rogue out uh, any male plants, uh, just more challenging to do when the plants are really close together. You can like, break branches off or you end up smelling like a dispensary and being really sticky after uh, rubbing up against a bunch of uh, hemp plants. Think about uh, air circulation relative to disease and the drying time required to prevent uh, fungal pathogens from growing. And then if you're trying to get good spray coverage into a really dense field that can be uh, more challenging. A couple of years ago, we were seeing people spray by, from helicopters because they couldn't drive through the field based on the arrangement. And in lower density systems, um, you get a higher plant per yield. And when seeds are expensive, and they are, folks this year are planting some uh, sort of like top end fancy varieties that are two or three dollars per seed, um, that having a higher per plant um, uh, per plant yield makes sense and minimizing the number of seeds you put out in the world makes sense as well. Can be easier to uh, control weeds in a, in a mechanical way if you've got a little bit more room between your plants. Um, though I think it's worth like sort of pausing here on, I think it's important to think how you're gonna uh, manage your field through the season. I was talking to a grower this year of, um, I would like to be spraying this with my little small like vineyard scale air blast sprayer. I can't fit it through the rows. And sometimes that gets me scratching my head of, wouldn't it make sense to set your rows at a size that you could drive your sprayer through them? Same thing with the mower to control weeds or other cultivation tools. You have got choices on making all these things match up. Um, don't care if it's a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, but it should probably uh, fit your equipment or the equipment you intend to use. Um, it can be easier to scout and just sort of like more comfortable to walk through a field. You've got better circul air circulation and can more easily spray um, materials into the canopies of those. So these are thinking about like sort of plants per acre kind of, um, kind of questions. Then we also just have like, how big of plants are you gonna try to grow? I just showed you a bunch of information about like, there's too much hemp in the world. Um, you can grow way more hemp than uh, you can sell. And so we get left with um, a situation that is maybe somewhat different than other agricultural realms that is not a yield maximizing one. It is one where I need to maximize quality and profitability rather than yield. And go out in middle or end of August a couple of years ago and take pictures of plants that are all at about the same, um, 
at the same uh, planted at the same spacing. And we can see that they can be grown huge big plants that again are shoulder to shoulder are more moderately sized where there's plenty of room for weeds to grow, but also easy to walk through those and you could run a, a lawn mower or something through those to control weeds. And then some really like poor and scraggly looking plants that have a good crop of uh, puncture vine, which is one of our challenging weeds uh, here in the West and some really scraggly poor looking um, poor looking hemp plants uh, in there. And so sometimes uh, I think about a, a quote that I hear from our viticulturist and he says that, um, Oh, let me see if I can remember this. He says that uh, nitrogen is the gas in your car and water is the throb. And that we can manipulate how much nitrogen fertilizer goes out and how much water we apply and we can grow a larger or a smaller crop. When you're growing for smokable flour, and in some cases when people are smoke growing for biomass for extraction, you're gonna harvest by hand and I think you realize how much biomass you can grow when your plant is seven feet tall and five feet wide. One person can't really carry that plant at harvest and so can cause some real logistical issues. And I would say that many of the growers who I have uh, been talking with this year are aiming for slightly smaller plants and slightly more spaced apart, that they're not trying to maximize yield, but there are some labor or logistical um, constraints that uh, keep, keep them uh, in that sort of more moderate realm. And then uh, last piece I want to talk about for a moment is transplanting versus uh, direct seeding. Um, very much the common practice in these systems for folks to trans to start in a greenhouse. They're planting uh, feminized seeds, and I think we probably had better luck with feminized seeds uh, out here in Oregon than uh, Sean has in Kentucky. Folks are pretty well on the like 99.9, 99.5% uh, feminized. Uh, we don't see a lot of uh, cloning. Uh, out here of vegetative propagation. Uh, most folks do that. We at the university say, well, that's an awful expensive way of planting a crop. And they say, well, when seeds are two or three dollars a piece, I'm not really interested in poor germination rates. And then we say, or last year we said, well, we'll show you, we're gonna direct seed some hemp. We directly seeded some hemp, came up, looked pretty good. We thinned it down to the stand densities that we were after, really pleased with it, happy with ourselves. Um, what a settling, everybody should be direct seeding. This year, we tried again. Had a little issue with timing. Planted a few days before it was 115 degrees. Um, a little bit late, had about 30% uh, germination and emergence. Uh, basically like sort of failed in our establishing our experiment because the germination was so poor. And so uh, remembering back to some of those sort of like critical details on establishment of uh, that Sean was talking about appropriate depth, appropriate environmental conditions, getting moisture at uh, the right amount and uh, right timing to those plants really is critical. I think it is possible to have direct seeded systems. I think it makes sense when you've got like less than a penny a seed in a fiber or seed production model. But if we're going to grow um, these sort of fancy high cannabinoid uh, feminized seeds that are going to be between a dollar and a couple of dollars a seed, I do think that there's some merit in uh, transplanting. Uh, that said, and I think I'll show, show you in my next presentation, we've got all sorts of issues with like the quality of transplants and what it means to uh, get a plant in the ground at just exactly the right time. But with that, I think I've reached the end of this spiel and I will stop. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Jones. You covered so much. And I know we have a lot of questions. Um, we're a little bit over on time, so we're just going to do 10 minutes of questions and then any remaining questions um, we'll compile and we'll send out an email with answers or you can always reach out to us through our hotline or through email. Um, but I'm gonna turn it over to Rex who has compiled questions and he's gonna ask um, our panelists. Yeah, well, there's, we got quite a few questions from the participants and I'll start, you know, there was one about what, what can, what, we can do with hemp. I think that's been answered. There's several markets. It, it's a very volatile market at this point, and but there are uh, several kind of market channels for hemp. But um, maybe somebody can talk about uh, you know the volatility of a market like this. Uh, probably is good to have contracts, but even contracts can be broken. But um, anyway, let's get to the. Next question, I think. Um, 
would it be more cost efficient? Ashlyn asks, uh, would it be more cost efficient to start from seed or transplant? And um, Dr. Gordon, you were just talking about that. Um, and I'll start with you and then uh, maybe Mike and uh, Sean can add in. Uh, I guess to my mind, I still think it might be. We got to like, uh, with when seeds are expensive, we really need to uh, dial in a system that allows for most of those seeds to germinate and emerge. Um, and I think there's more to be done on, I don't know the, the right answer on exactly when we should be planting. We've not done the planting depth kind of trials. Um, need to have like a, uh, a sufficient amount of field preparation to have a pretty fine uh, seed bed that's out there. And that, um, but you've got often a couple dollars in the exercise of starting that transplant in the greenhouse. And you've got, I don't know how much, but some more dollars and some more time to get that transplant into the ground. And we often see issues on transplant success because of root bound timing, leggy, long plants um, is often what we're talking to people about early in the season. And so cutting that whole sort of chunk of operation out of your business model, like seems like a desirable goal. Am I ready to tell people to do that? Not really. Hmm. Seems like it can be expensive if it goes awry at a $2 a seed. Right. Mike or Sean, do you have anything to add? I mean, I'll just add, I think it, it's dependent on what you're doing, right? I mean, what's right for me may not be right for you. Uh, you know, Dr. Lucas and I both know a, a lady that produces CBD, but it's her own product and it's much more cost effective for her to take cuttings and do transplants than it would be for me or, or someone else. So I, th I think some of it comes down to, you know, I, I think that's what Dr. Jones was alluding to. I mean, some of this comes down to personal preference and how your system is, is set up and established. Yeah, I think it has to do with your scale to a degree as well. I mean, uh, you know, smaller scales, a little more forgiving for coming in from transplants. And as Gordon alluded to, you have a little more certainty. And I will say, uh, I'm glad that Gordon has seen um, more success with feminized seed. I mean, that is, if we can get those percentages up, that's a little bit of a game changer in terms of uh of of saving you you on some labor and that's where a lot of your cost is going to come in you know the seeds are expensive but then you compound that with the labor at the end of the season um and, and i will say that actually i forgot about my experience last year with an auto flower variety that was feminized i pulled out one male that's it the whole season so it was pretty much 99 percent uh, 2019 though, man, I, I walked through some fields that were feminized, uh, in name only and hmm. pulled out 50% of the plants. So, uh, yeah, you gotta be real careful. That's why I was pointing at getting to know who you're buying your seeds and clones from. And as Gordon pointed out, <laughs> some of the nefarious, uh, people, uh, filled their bag with money in 2018 and have left the industry. <laughs> right. Well, that's a volatile uh, market with such as it's a relatively small industry at this point. Yeah. Uh, staying on the seeds, um, Gregory asks, are certified seeds available to ensure lower probability of diseases or you know, things like that? And I would put that to the panel. I mean, that's just, it's, you're just now seeing it start. I mean, there are some IOSCA certified seeds for grain and fiber coming out of Europe and Australia. Um, just starting to see some, um, you know, some releases of some domestic varieties that have, have been bred. Um, so there are certified seeds uh, available, but <clears throat> more going to be on the, the grain and, and fiber side and, and less on the cannabinoid side just because of, well, I mean, the cannabinoid genetics come out of the can cannabis genetics. Right? And I can only imagine tracing, trying to trace medical or recreational cannabis genetics. So I think that's going to be a bit further off. Right. And that's a huge point. I'm actually working with a guy in Colorado uh, who is trying to get cannabinoid varieties uh, certified. I think it's through IOSCA, but he's not certifying seed. He is certifying clonal material. And that has to do with the mm. fact that it is uh, still very volatile volatile genetics wise within these uh, cannabinoid varieties. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Gordon, any, any comments on that? 
um, just, uh, I think most people are not planting certified seed. I think a lot of hemp growers would say, what is certified seed if we pass them? Because again, like sort of new to commercial agriculture, the, we do push people to think about that you can send like a handful of seed to a lab and say, can I get germination rate? Can I get vigor on these seedlings? And that is a wise thing to do. It won't have come with like the yellow tag or the stamped tag of being certified seed, but you can at least know that I'm, I've got seed that seems like it's gonna grow. It may not be the variety I need or the strain that I need, but at least it'll grow before you invest a bunch in putting it in the ground. Okay, thank you for those. Um, we have a question from Govinda. He asks about what about swath swathing uh, for grain production? And it sounds like um, I think one of you had mentioned, uh, I think Sean had uh, mentioned, uh, there's a fair amount of shatter uh, that goes along with these uh, grain crops and uh, the hemp grain crops. Uh, any comments on swathing them? Yeah, I, I'm I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around what swathing is. <laughs> are we using, oh, a, well, are we so, using a, a scythe to, to chop it down? I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I'm, I guess I'm probably more uh, just in tune with what's going on with mechanized equipment, which is kind of unfortunate since the other side of my job is talking a lot about agrarianism. But uh, but um, yeah, what I, I guess I want, want some clarification on what he's getting at. Right. Well. I can only interpret uh, what he's written and Govinda, if you're on there, can you please uh, clarify in the chat and we'll, we'll catch up with that. Um, there's a question from our Montana office. Uh, does being organic increase profitability over say a three to five year period? Tricky, tricky. Not if you can't sell it. <laughs> right. Define, define profitability. I mean, yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, so on paper, and, and I, you know, when I was putting this presentation together, I I had some slides that that I that I took out that were from some other presentations, you know, and I kind of uh, one of the one of the things I had in there was a, an organic product that uh, back in 2019 it cost twice as much. Uh, for the organic product compared to a comparable, and this is a CBD extract, uh, compared to a comparable um, non-organic product. So in theory, yeah, I mean, you're still, if you could put the organic logo on a product, you got the price premium that goes with it. And we saw that uh, with products, uh, you know, with hemp CBD products and cannabinoid extracts. But I think the bigger problem is, is that, you know, especially, from 2019 onward, we had overestimated demand so much. Um, I, I grew outside of what I do at the university. I grew three and a half acres with a partner in 2019. It was certified organic. It tested between eight and 11 percent CBD. Um, and you saw the picture of him dumping it in his green in his high tunnel, right? So organic or not, if you can't sell it, you're not going to make a profit. So I think uh, you know there's definitely demand. There's definitely increasing awareness about organic. Um, I should I should scale that back. I, demand is probably too strong of a word. There's there's increasing awareness about organic and interest from people who want to make organic products because if you're selling CBD as a healthcare product or a health uh, you know supplement, eh, people kind of like that organic fact or a factor. But you know again, it's the market. You know if you can't sell it, it's not going to entail much more profit. Well, and I. Um, I did just get a, a message back on the swathing, but I do want to uh, touch too, Sean, on, I mean, there's no, I mean, there's not an abundance of certified organic processors, right? I mean, most- of Absolutely. Your... That was a major bottleneck that we ran into in 2019. Um, and, and I do know some organic processors. One of the comments that I wanted to make that I didn't get a chance in the 20 minute presentation is that the people who seem like they're doing okay are these boutique growers and processors. And I don't know if it was you or Gordon, uh, one of the two of y'all touched on, um, you know, the boutique processors that are growing their own and processing their own and selling locally small scale. I know a few farmers here in Lexington, uh, Louisville, uh, Central Kentucky area that are doing okay that way. Okay, but they still have, they're not even growing this year because they still have flour from 2019 and 2020 that they're still trying to process just for their own extraction and marketing, you know, programs. 
So, okay. uh, Rex, I did get um, someone messaged me. I think it was direct to me um, in reference to the swathing. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the question and let Gordon and, and Sean answer it. Sure. <laughs> Organic grain growers swath small grains before um, picking up with a combine <clears throat> to, to reduce loss, like with lentils or something like that. So that's what they're referring to is swathing. Um, I would I would not recommend it, but I'm I'm not an expert. Just knowing what I know about how quickly this seed can start to degenerate after you've harvested it, I, I believe you'd be opening yourself up to more problems and solutions. And there I went and just answered the question I said I was going to let you answer. Have you missed me? I don't know enough about it, but I agree with Mike on that. I mean, you got to be real careful with the grain, otherwise you're going to end up with your with your grain on the ground um, and then a nice volunteer crop the next year, I guess. Yeah, I, I can't really comment on, on that either. All right, well, Catherine, um, I, I'm guessing we used up our 10 minutes. Yeah, I think, I think we're running out of time, but we will have more time at the end for another round of Q and A. So if anyone didn't get their questions answered, we can go back to it at the end. Um, and again, you can always reach out to us. So we're gonna move on now to the next part of our panel. Alrighty, so I'm, I'm back again doing the double header here. Um, and as I was polishing my slides this morning, I was reflecting on the title of this section, Hemp Agronomy 101, and how I wish we could actually teach Hemp Agronomy 101. And in 101, I've got a textbook. I go through the textbook, it has the right answers. The exam is, is it A, is it B, is it C? What are, the, they're just right answers to be had. This feels to me like hemp in 2021, if we're taking a class on it, it's a 501 like graduate level class where we're gonna sit and we're gonna have a discussion of the pros and cons. There is no right answer. And so um, I'd encourage you to any, um, anytime anyone gives you information about hemp, I encourage you to stick it into your mental model and say, how does this fit with what I can do, what I want to do, what makes sense to me intuitively? Because there is not a right answer. Um, that said, let's proceed. I'd like to talk a little bit uh, in more detail about fertilization. And I'll show you a little bit of data out of uh, North Carolina on some fertilization in response to that. Um, we'll talk to you about some weed control practices that we see around here and some challenges with those and a little bit about irrigation as well. So on to fertilizer, um, I have fun that our co-ops and sort of agricultural supply stores are making a good, good deal of money on um, these like sort of special graphic kind of materials that get sold to hemp growers because they need pretty looking fertilizer containers. And something that strikes me about fertilization or sort of the, the standard practice and standard practice comes from experts who were uh, in the marijuana industry and, in the, and often in like the containerized, because I'm growing in my like grandparents' closet, but I'm in a container, it's not proper soil. Um, their approach is a vegetative time fertilizer that is high in nitrogen and a bloom time uh, fertilizer that is uh, low in nitrogen and high in PNK. Um, we will talk about this some more when I get to come back to it, but just want to show you these whoops, veg versus bloom fertilizers in addition to pretty graphics. Um, if we like go back to soil fertility 101, and that is a class that you could take and probably sh um, should one day if you're curious, um, yield response to soil fertility in the realm of soil testing is based on these like calibrated curves where here they were growing wheat in the Willamette Valley, uh, lots of different sites. They use a Bray 1P soil test, which is a pretty standard phosphorus extractant for us in uh, Western Oregon. And then they look at how much uh, grain wheat do you grow? When there's no phosphorus at all in the soil, you grow very little. Uh, at some point, there is an adequate amount of phosphorus in the soil, um, and you, you pass what's called a critical value. Adding more phosphorus does not increase yields. Uh, for phosphorus and potassium, we can do soil tests and we can make these predictions. These have been well calibrated on lots of crops, on lots of soils. Um, in Oregon, we use this Bray 1 extractant, as I was mentioning in the previous spiel. Um, there are different extractants and different calibrations for different regions, soil mineralogies, and uh, sort of pH levels. Um, and so I know that if I have a soil test of 100 and it's a hemp field, I'm going to say, no, probably don't need more phosphorus. Don't really care what like your grower friend told you who's been growing marijuana. 
If you've got high soil test phosphorus, probably don't need more vegetative flour. I don't care. You've got enough in the soil. If you've got one part per million of phosphorus, um, that is going to say, oh, regardless of the crop, I'm going to guess at yield limiting phosphorus deficiency. And so we know some sort of standard things like that. Um, let me back up on this and give you some assumptions. My assumptions are twofold. One is that you're growing in mineral soil. There's work that gets done in greenhouses, that gets done in containerized systems. Those are soilless organic media. Uh, they behave differently than mineral soils do. And the other uh, um, assumption is that your crop has an adequate uh, root system. We're talking about transplanting challenges. Uh, root system issues come from that. I'll show you a picture. Uh, if your plant has this kind of root system, uh, or this I like keep on my desk to remind me about bad transplanting practices that is like the cutoff stub of some really root bound roots. Um, you can generally have pretty fertile soil. If you have like no roots at all on your plant, it's going to be a very, uh, your plants are gonna have a very hard time taking up those nutrients. And so I'm assuming you're working in mineral soil and that you've like grown a plant that is not tremendously root bound. Um, and then let me show you, there's like relatively little research published on sort of any agronomic component of hemp production. And so sometimes people like really like latch on to the bits that are out there. And this is a paper that I had several people forward to me uh, a couple of years ago, maybe in 2019, thinking about fertilization requirements for hemp. So this is a study out of Canada where they are looking at fiber hemp and are looking at responses to nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium fertilization. If you like didn't pay to access this journal article, it didn't have the whole thing. And I do think it's good to check out peer reviewed literature. We sort of need to have some of this background theory uh, in some cases to understand that. I read the last sentence of this and it said, potassium uh, uh, and phosph phosphorus and potassium fertilization had very limited effect on biomass and seed yields in the competition in all environments. They had a number of different sites they were looking at this and they did not see uh, responses to phosphorus and potassium though they did see responses to nitrogen. And so then I have a grower in Oregon email me this paper and say, well, I'm not gonna apply any phosphorus or potassium. And I say, well, that's one study from Canada that found that they did not respond to phosphorus and potassium. We know like, uh, pretty reasonably that plants do require phosphorus and potassium. Um, and so like, what's the deal here? We've got to like read the whole paper and find the one paragraph on page eight of 10 where we can like zoom in on this and they say it is possible that the relatively limited uh, response to phosphorus that we observed could uh, partly be due to the high initial phosphorus levels uh, in all environments in the study. And so uh, when they go through and do soil tests to start, they've got more than 100 parts per million of phosphorus. They're using a different extractant than the one I was just showing you on that wheat slide, but there's plenty of phosphorus in the soil. Adding more will not increase yields. That's why they found this in this study. Um, if they had started on really lean uh, phosphorus poor soils, theory tells us, add more phosphorus, yield increases. Um, and so that's really just an exercise on like remembering how uh, soil fertility guidelines work and the challenge with like just reading the abstract of a journal. Um, let's now uh, look at a study out of uh, uh, North Carolina. I've done a very similar study to this uh, here in Southern Oregon. Um, they have prettier pictures, and so I'm gonna use those. My plots were pretty small. Um, some uh, researchers uh, in North Carolina looked at uh, nitrogen and potassium rates on floral hemp and looked at one variety, uh, five rates of nitrogen, five rates of potassium. Uh, let's look at a aerial image of those. The top set of plots are uh, the nitrogen responses and the bottom set of plots are potassium responses. And again, back to our like soil fertility 101, the most limiting nutrient in any terrestrial system is almost always nitrogen. And so you can almost always see a nitrogen response from a distance in a nitrogen uh, fertilizer trial. And we can see that here. If we like look at this one uh, block on the upper right hand corner, uh, they've got sort of different treatments in five different blocks and then are replicated in the different columns. Um, I feel quite confident in betting that their zero rate of nitrogen is this uh, plot down here at the bottom of the strip and their maximum rate of nitrogen is this second from the top. Plants get greener, they produce more chlorophyll, more protein when uh, more nitrogen is applied. Makes sense. If we look at the potassium responses, we can squint at that. I'm not sure if we see a potassium response there. Um, at least in my life sort of 
visual from a thousand feet away across the country kind of view. Um, now let's look at the data. We'll start with nitrogen. They did this at two different sites. They find a slightly different uh, response at each of those two sites. But uh, total biomass yield per acre increases at the 0, 50, 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen fertilizer applied. And at the one site, they, they determine it levels off at about 125 pounds uh, per acre, and the other is about 170 pounds per acre. Um, we could think about soil texture and mineralogy on reasons why these would differ. Makes some sense. Um, and so this is a pretty like reasonable agronomic rate. Lots of fairly high producing crops would, would be in that 100, 150, 175 pounds of nitrogen per acre to grow a field crop of a whole, a whole range of sorts. Um, and so not, not really unexpected that we can grow bigger plants, higher yielding plants with more nitrogen fertilizer added. Then if we go to the potassium trial, so you have a straight line all across at both sites. And so we say, huh, we know that plants need potassium. Why would it be that these, um, these uh, plots did not respond to added potassium? So then we go like a noodle in there, figure out what is that starting potassium level? Do they have, is there enough potassium there to start with or is it limiting? And they have pretty high potassium levels to start. And so we're on that flat part of that yield curve, adding more potassium, doesn't make any difference. That's what we, they, sh they show us here. And then cannabinoids. Um, up on the, the top, we see two plots of nitrogen rate responses. Left-hand side is CBD, right-hand side is THC. Bottom plots, same pattern of CBD on the left and THC on the right. Uh, potassium being the fertilizer they use. There is no change in the amount of THC or CBD produced in a percentage form by across that whole range of nutrients supplied. It's basically the same. We can grow a bigger plant of potency X. We can grow a smaller plant of potency X by manipulating how much nitrogen is applied. It does not change the percentage of uh, cannabinoids in that floral tissue. And so when I like come back to this question of uh, bloom time fertilizer versus vegetative fertilizer, we say that like, no, plants probably are not fundamentally demanding um, different quantities of nutrients turns towards uh, bloom time. They don't need more potassium and phosphorus. They may well need less nitrogen when they're forming those flowers. Uh, but if our soil test is adequate for phosphorus and potassium, adding more, even at bloom time when the marijuana growers think it needs more, probably does not make any difference. Uh, this gets more complicated when we start to talk about like sort of smoking quality and the organoleptic nature of consumption of uh, hemp, how it tastes. Um, not going to get into that, really no science, and I bet it's going to be a while before OSU allows us to do a hemp tasting trial, um, given some of the constraints on those kind of things, if that makes sense. Um, weed control. Many growers that we um, interact with are using a, a system of plastic culture for weed control are bedding up soil and laying down uh, sheet plastic. Um, works pretty well, it's not uncommon in vegetable systems and used sometimes in organic agriculture. Um, it's a big change for us. We haven't seen this much uh, plastic culture in the Rogue Valley um, ever, I don't think. And challenge with it is that uh, that plastic will get pulled up, it'll be dirty. Um, it's low grade plastic to start with, it is not recyclable. It ends up in the landfill and that results in concerns. And I think for, for good reason for many folks, um, but with plastic laid down and some accommodation for weed control in between that plastic, you can grow a pretty clean crop without um, a huge amount of trouble. That said, plastic is not a, a magical material. I think that in 2019, we found growers who were feeling like it was. I laid down plastic. That's what they say to do. And that will control the weeds. Here is an example of a field that you're going to have to believe me that there's hemp growing in there. I do think you can see a little bit of sheet plastic laid out in rows. But some of this dark green in the middle is, um, is hemp put down their plastic. They transplanted their hemp. They walked away and thought, this is my entire weed control plan. There's still a little bit of moisture in the soil. They grew a heap of grass weeds. Um, I think some of this field got harvested, lots of it didn't. Um, it's, you've got a, like any part of agriculture, weed control is part of a big plan on weed control and is not one activity or it's best done not as one activity. Um, we see folks that don't use plastic, use cultivation and hand weeding to pull that off. Here's a pretty clean looking field where um, with careful evaluation of soil moisture at planting and using drip tape to just put moisture at the root zone of his crop, was able to keep lots of weeds from growing. 
uh, does lots of uh, hand, um, hand weeding and some level of sort of run the rototiller down the row. And in a couple more weeks from when this picture is taken, the plants will be big enough that they'll do an awful lot of uh, shading and crowding out of, of the weeds. That said, um, other folks choose not to use plastic because philosophical concerns or costs associated with it. You can grow a lot of weeds. This is sort of a blurry picture because I took like first thing in the morning, but hemp plants uh, out in the field, no plastic used, um, a ton of weeds grew. In the background, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six field workers with weed whackers going through and trying to rescue a crop that has uh, been overtopped, um, overtopped by weeds. Uh, has to be an extraordinarily expensive exercise to get that behind and have to get caught up. And so again, we've got to think through a whole system of what uh, allows weeds to grow and all the tools that'll be in the toolbox. Um, it would be great if you could run a mower down those rows instead of having to run a weed whacker down the row if you've spaced your plants properly, if you've got a mower that fits that system. Um, and this year I've seen a couple other sort of interesting uh, kinds of weed control floor management. Here was a uh, winter cover crop. I think that's either barley or triticale planted the previous fall. Um, got mown in the spring as it became reproductive. Did a strip of tillage uh, right in the planting row, transplanted into that and have a little bit of sort of like green mulch growing but haven't had to till the whole field. They went through and mowed this again. They never put water in these row middles and no weeds grow there, can make it through the season with relatively minimal, um, minimal weed control. Then another one that was, I think, unintentional, but kind of cool. This is like as vigorous a uh, living mulch as I've come across in, the, um, in a hemp field. And uh, they just like turned in a cover crop with lots of brassicas late. There was still moisture in the ground. They transplanted their hemp and that cover crop re-sprouted. And so unintentional, but probably good sort of insectary habitat in there. Um, and then on to irrigation. Um, most folks we interact with are doing drip irrigation. That's under this plastic or it's on the soil surface. Um, works pretty well, keeps the plants from getting wet. In Southern Oregon and most of the West Coast, we've got this Mediterranean climate. It will rain until June or until May or maybe June. Then it basically stops raining and we'll get rain again in October, November, sometimes uh, September. And so we can keep the crop dry and dramatically reduces issues with fungal pathogen growth. Um, that said, there are folks who do overhead irrigation. On our trials here at the research station, uh, we irrigate them overhead with sprinklers. Out in central Oregon and eastern Oregon, we see folks growing under a, a center pivot. Um, it does uh, induce some more disease challenges that need to be managed, but is when you have existing infrastructure, you can often make that existing infrastructure work. And then here's uh, a little bit of sort of preliminary data out of an irrigation rate trial. And this is in Northeastern Oregon, where they were applying diminishing rates of water from 29 inches down to 16 inches uh, season long. This is one full season CBG variety um, that not really any difference between these 29 and uh, 20 inch uh, total flower yields that we do see a drop off. Um, as they get down to 16 inches and makes sense that like anyone who's managed a flower pot on your porch knows that plants do need water or they really will not grow. Um, and then I think interestingly they do see a decline in the percentage of CBD in that flower um, as they reduce the amount of irrigation that's applied season long. I think I've seen other studies or preliminary data out of other studies that doesn't actually show this, shows that like a relatively stable quantity of cannabinoids under different water stress uh, environments. Uh, that said, these are these data. This was a randomized and replicated trial. Um, they'll take some more data on this and we'll get you a firmer, a firmer answer. And then uh, in terms of the yield, the yield uh, declines for sort of pounds of CBGA that they were able to grow because they're growing uh, less flour with less water and less potent flour with less water applied. Um, that said, this year we're having reasonably catastrophic drought that our irrigation water supply has been off for um, months now. There's lots of hemp out in the field, including here at the research station that we've not been able to water for about a month. The biggest, healthiest looking plants still look pretty big and healthy. The ones that looked kind of like iffy are getting kind of stressed. And so there is, um, the, I think the, mm, the right answer is still out on exactly how uh, drought tolerant uh, is hemp 
could it be dry farmed in some environments on some soils? Um, this season long irrigation versus shutting off the irrigation in the middle, plenty of questions still to be answered with research. But with that, I will wrap up and we'll take questions back at our Q&A session at the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Now on to Dr. Britt. Great, right. nice talk, Gordon. That was really good information. So let's see. Okay, you can see my PowerPoint slide, right? Not the notes. Yep. Cool, thank you. All right, hi everyone, I'm Katie. I'm a postdoc um, located in the Central Valley of California. I'm new to California. I'm coming here from Virginia um, where Catherine mentioned it earlier, but I completed my PhD there this spring where the focus of my research was insect pest management in hemp. So today I'm talking with you about hemp IPM, which is mainly insects because I'm an entomologist and that's what my background consists of. So today I'm gonna share with you what you can mainly expect to see in hemp, some of which are pests, some are beneficials, and a lot of them are just incidentals, meaning that these are species that are in the crop because it's present. They're there, but they're not really doing much harm. So. I want to let you know what can actually harm your crop and what's not going to do anything. And along the way, I've kind of sprinkled in some research results to back up what I'm saying. So before I dive into the insect and mite portion, I just want you all to know from a research perspective where we are. Um, so as you all know, hemp was historically grown in the United States. Um, it was a huge crop that did a lot for our country, but you know, that acreage was mainly focused on fiber production, as you can see in these photos. And there's still information from this period that exists and is a really helpful starting point for us right now. But, you know, you've heard all the speakers before me were basically saying that's not what our acreage is anymore. Primary acreage in the United States right now is for cannabinoid production, for better or for worse. And that's completely different from this historical period. So, you know, we also live in a very different world today with climate change affecting insect range expansion and the number of generations of insects per year. Um, so pest management today is a tougher battle than it has been in the past. Plus, you know, this crop was um, prohibited for so long for research. So again, from a researcher perspective from a university, we're doing what we can. We're very behind though, but I'm gonna share with you what we've learned so far. Um, you know, one of the biggest points I want to make today is that pest concerns depend on the crop in use. So hemp is a multifaceted plant, like the other speakers have alluded to, you know, we grow hemp for fiber, we grow it for grain, and we grow it for cannabinoids. Um, you know, insect and mite concerns in this type of hemp, meaning grain and fiber, um, is fairly low. You know, honestly, shatter, seed shatter um, or bird feeding on seeds is more of a greater risk in these varieties than insect and mite pests. Um, this is not the case for hemp grown for cannabinoids. Um, insect and mite pests are a far greater challenge here. Um, but again, even within this system, um, end use determines how much damage this crop can withstand. So if the crop's going to be sold for biomass or oil extraction, it can sustain a higher level of damage. But if it's being sold as raw, raw floral material, kind of like Sean was saying earlier about these boutique, um, boutique situations where people are marketing their flower as raw material, um, damage potential is really low and the consumer is going to want a near flawless product. Um, you know, some more information about the research end of this crop. Um, a central component of integrated pest management is an economic threshold. It, de it determines everything we do. It determines the decisions that we make throughout the season. Um, but yet again, you know, we have not established these thresholds for insect and mite pests um, because one, you know, the research to establish these thresholds is still ongoing. It's still a new crop. And second, as other speakers have said, the economic market here is still developing. So back to the central focus um, for me today, it's insects and mites that are present in hemp. When you're growing this crop, you're going to find a lot of insects and mites present in the crop, but a lot of them are opportunistic um, or incidental, meaning that they're making use of your crop as a food source um, for 
reproduction and feeding because, sorry, because it's there. A lot of these are concerning, a lot of them are not. So the way I've set up this presentation today, I've grouped species based on certain characteristics, uh, mainly their feeding type or insect versus mite. So the first group I'm gonna discuss is chewing insects. These aren't the biggest concern, or at least the ones that feed from leaves, but I still want to show you what they look like and tell you why I think they're not a concern. So you're going to see things in your crop like grasshoppers. They mostly just hang out and feed from leaf material. In certain um, extreme situations, they can feed from stems and kind of clip stems and cause the plant to fall over. Um, this normally happens earlier in the season and it can be really challenging um, because they're so sporadically placed throughout the field and it's really difficult to manage them for that reason. Um, in terms of managing this chemically, I don't really recommend spraying for grasshoppers because one, any chemical option to manage this pest is not likely to be allowed for use in hemp. And second, they are so sporadic throughout the field that it's difficult to manage them with the few options that are available. Other things include beetles like cucumber beetles, these spotted colorful beetles, flea beetles that can chew little holes in the leaves of the plant, scarab beetles, these are frequently attracted to grain varieties. They really love the pollen in those plants. Um, and they can also feed from leaves on cannabinoid varieties as well. Um, but to sum up the beetles, you know, we mainly see generalist chewing species. So they come in, chew a little bit on the leaves and then they move on. Um, and yield usually doesn't seem to be affected. And so I, like I was saying earlier, I feel pretty comfortable telling you not to worry about these types of chewers because um, I did conduct a field study to simulate this type of chewing injury to see whether or not it might affect yield. So this experiment involved removing various amounts of leaf area from hemp plants in both grain and cannabinoid varieties at various times throughout the growing season. So the amounts of leaf area I chose to remove were 25, 50, and 75 percent, and these were defoliated at 20, 40, and 60 days after planting. And I used shears to clip off this leaf surface area. So what I was able to see after two years of doing this study in, like I said, both grain varieties and cannabinoid varieties is that neither yield nor cannabinoid concentrations were affected um, at least in the particular varieties that I was working with. I think this is really helpful information for this industry and it's, it's you know, hopefully gonna provide you a little bit of relief if you see that some of your leaf area has been chewed on or removed. It's not going to really affect your yield or cannabinoid production at the end of the season. So um, I mentioned leaf chewers, but we also have other insects that can feed throughout the plant including leaves and more in the bud area, which is the marketable portion of this cannabinoid um, type of hemp. So corn earworm can be found feeding mainly on the bud material and leaves to a slightly lesser extent. Sometimes this worm can re be really difficult to see because it can nestle within the bud material like you see in the photo on the left. And in addition to feeding on buds, they can sometimes chew and damage on stems like you see in the photo on the right. So the biggest and most concerning issue with this insect is um, what we colloquially refer to as bud rot. So bud rot is this brown looking plant material that you see in both of these photos. So it's not a direct result of corn earworm feeding, but we commonly see this where these worms are present and where they have fed. So what happens is the worm comes in, chews on these portions of the plant, either the top portion or somewhere throughout the bud, wherever it's kind of hanging out. Um, they chew on the plant. This creates a feeding wound, which allows environmental pathogens to come in and it leads to rotted material. So corn earworms have these um, chewing mouth parts, much like you and I, these really strong jaws that can chew on this plant material, cause these wounds and allow these pathogens to get in. So again, if you're, like I mentioned earlier, end use dictates the damage potential here. You're selling this as biomass. It's not the biggest concern because you can probably, you can pick some of it out, which is also not desirable. But, you know, if, if it's all going into a big, um, if it's all being processed together, it's not as big of an issue. But if you're selling this as raw material, 
you wouldn't want to purchase something that looks like this. So it creates a lot of problems. Um, really quickly, I'm going to touch on an insecticide trial that I did in Virginia last summer or last September. Um, this was conducted in the eastern region of Virginia. I know we're in the west now. It's not Virginia, but I still think the data from this trial are, are important information to help manage this pest um, throughout the United States. Um, so I started spraying these plants in early September and early flowering when worms were present. They were sprayed three times, and then I counted the number of worms present on 10 buds per plot. Um, so this is, these are the results. I'm going to break this down, though, and make it a little more digestible for you. Um, so as a, a key to this graph here, um, along the x-axis or the horizontal axis, is the insecticide treatment that I use. And the y-axis or the vertical axis shows the number of earworms counted on 10 buds per plot. And then in the gray bar along the bottom of the slide, I have a key or a color legend to help you understand the active ingredient in the insecticide that I used. So this dotted bar shows the number of worms that were in the untreated control plot which is the amount of earworms you could expect if you did not treat your plants at all. The products in black are considered the industry standard. They are not allowed for use in hemp, but we tested them out as part of this trial to see how well the other products held up compared to these. Um, most important here is the products in green. So these products are all biological insecticides with an active ingredient called a nucleopolyhedrovirus, and that's a really big word, um, but it can be abbreviated NPV. So the specific virus in these products attacks corn earworm exclusively. Um, so no off-target effects whatsoever to other insect species in the plot or to mammals, rodents, birds, reptiles, humans, anything that might be in this plot. Um, so, you know, the values here were not significantly, statistically significantly different from several of the other products, but there was still a noticeable reduction in the number of worms in these plots. Um, plus, you know, they are biological insecticides, they're approved for use in organic production, so they actually offer us a bit of a solution here to manage this pest. Um, so just to sum up that pest, because it's so important, um, it's going to remain a damaging pest and a challenge for hemp for the foreseeable future until we can conduct more research trials, get more information, and figure out how to manage it. Um, at this time, the best option for management is to scout regularly and initiate control tactics at the first appearance of larvae. Um, and if you choose to go the spray route, I think the best option is to use one of these NPV insecticides um, because you may be familiar with BT products. I haven't talked about them too much today, but there's a lot of resistance that occurs to these products throughout the United States. So these virus products offer a better solution. Um, and as we're able to conduct more research in the future, we'll have more sustainable long-term management strategies. So another one I, I wanted to mention, this is a chewer, but it's more of what we call a boring pest. Um, this is the European corn borer. It tunnels into the stem of hemp plants, and depending on what the crop is being grown for, um, it could cause the plant to lodge and fall over because it, it won't be stable. It's going to fall over um, because this has been chewed. This was one of the historical pests of hemp. Um, but I did want to offer um, some good, I guess, some good news here. Um, when I have seen it in cannabinoid varieties, it hasn't really damaged the plant that much. It has been present. Um, as you can see, this sawdust looking stuff here, it chews its way through the plant. This stuff kind of comes out of the holes. So it's really undesirable to have it on the plant, but it's not a complete death sentence for a plant like I kind of once thought it would be. And this just shows you what the caterpillar looks like. All right, so enough with chewers and caterpillars. I'm gonna move on now to piercing sucking insects, which includes things like aphids and stink bugs. Um, so the first here is cannabis aphid. Um, this one is interesting because it's a specialist. It feeds exclusively from hemp or cannabis crops. You can see this if hemp is grown indoors or outdoors. Um, it's typically light green or clear in coloration. 
um, and they can frequently be seen in heavy densities on leaves, stems, and all throughout the plant. So one of the concerns here for me is that once this, as this insect feeds on the plant and moves along, it emits this sticky substance that we call honeydew that creates a sticky layer on the surface of the plant. Additionally, when this insect molts and sheds its exoskeleton, those um, exoskeletons or skins can get caught in this sticky material, makes it really undesirable. Indoors, it can get out of hand pretty quickly. This is a pretty extreme case of cannabis aphid infestation. As you can imagine, it's really undesirable um, no matter what the end use is for this type of hemp. Um, it's especially undesirable if that's being sold as raw material. No one's going to want to purchase something that has um, little insect bodies in it or shed bodies of an insect. Um, plus, it's super sticky. Um, these shiny bubble looking things on this leaf are what we call aphid mummies, it means they have been attacked by a tiny little parasitoid wasp, um, which is really good. It's a form of biological control. However, when you see this in your crop, it kind of means that the problem has gone too far and these random occurrences of uh, aphid mummies aren't enough to really stop this insect in its tracks. So what can you do? There are a few things that you can do. Um, if it's indoors, you wanna make sure you're inspecting your plants prior to putting them in your indoor environment, making sure they're pest free before you start growing them. And it's you know, a really easy thing to employ natural enemies that you can get from any type of biological control company, just BioBest, Copert, um, things like that. Outdoors, you definitely wanna get rid of crop debris at the end of the season, decrease the chance of volunteer crops coming up so that this insect has a suitable host. And we also wanna let natural enemies do their jobs. There's a lot of um, good insects out there like lady beetles and lace wings, and they can really help manage this pest. Um, if it comes to it with insecticides, I would recommend using a soap or an oil. Pyrethrin should be a last resort as those are pretty broad spectrum and can kill off good, um, good insects as well. So there are other aphid species that you can see in the crop. Um, they will cause similar types of damage, but the most important thing with the other species is that you want to make sure you correctly identify the species before um, taking any management um, action. Really quickly, You'll see stink bugs often in this crop, but to, you know, based on my observations and research that I've done with these in hemp, they are not going to harm the crop at all. Um, again, trying to keep this brief, I'm running out of time, but I did a small study um, in a controlled environment where we reared brown marmorated stink bugs on either corn or hemp. And what we found was that they survived better on hemp than corn, which is a known host plant. So that's one important thing to know that they can conduct a life cycle on hemp. And second, um, I was curious to see whether stink bug, stink bug feeding would cause crop injury. Um, so I caged stink bugs on hemp in the field. Um, and after the period of caging these insects on the crop, I was not able to see any type of resulting injury or negative impact to the crop from the bug, stink bugs being on the plant. So again, hemp can serve as a suitable host plant for a stink bug, but feeding doesn't lead to crop injury, which is more important. Um, other things you might see, ligus bugs, um, such as legume bugs, um, tarnished plant bug, and false chinch bugs. More often than not, I've seen those species on grain variety hemp, but still not really a cause for concern. I've never seen any type of resulting crop injury from their presence or feeding. I've seen a lot of white flies this summer out in California. Um, they are definitely present in the crop, definitely feeding, but the important takeaway for this insect is it doesn't look like it's damaging yield. And in conversations with others from throughout the United States, they've seen them as well, but still not seeing any negative impact. So it's not the most concerning pest that could be present. Same thing for thrips. You can see these indoors and outdoors. They will feed from all throughout the plant. They can cause the stippling appearance like on the stem 
or on the leaf on the right, but like the white flies, they're not the biggest cause for concern. Leaf hoppers are another piercing sucking pest. Um, they um, have, they're really tiny. Um, adults have wings, nymphs do not. Nymphs are on the left. When they feed from plants, they cause what we call hopper burn. You can see it here on these plants. It's the kind of yellowing um, or kind of burnt edges on these leaves. Um, and they can also cause this distorted looking appearance on the leaves. Um, it's just what happens when they feed from plants. Um, there are toxic substances in their saliva that can lead to this result. So here in the West, we have what's called the beet leaf hopper. It's only present west of the Rockies, so it's something that we're going to have to be on the lookout for. Um, I've seen several occurrences of this type of appearance on hemp this summer coming from that leaf hopper. Um, but the biggest question we have, and we haven't been able to address this in any of our research yet, um, although it causes this weird appearance on plants, which is really undesirable, um, it, it may not affect yield. And that's, you know, depending on crop end use, that's really important to know because if it's not affecting yield, then there's the potential that we don't have to manage it. So just something to look out for. Again, this is a really distinct appearance that comes from this insect feeding. All right, the last group um, before the beneficials is mites. So mites are similar to insects, but they have eight legs. So they're really closely related to spiders. Um, hemp russet mite is one that's pretty concerning in hemp and cannabis. Um, like the cannabis aphid that I talked about earlier, it is a specialist in that it exclusively feeds from hemp and cannabis as well. So it's a really tiny mite. You cannot see it with the naked eye. And when it feeds from the plant, it can cause this grayish coloration, as you can see in the photo on the right, because it's feeding from these epidermal cells in the plant and it's killing them as it feeds, which leads to this gray or kind of dirty coloration in the leaf tissue. Um, depending on where the mite is feeding, whether above or on the top of the leaf or at the lower side of the leaf, that influences which way the leaves may curl. Um, so sometimes they can curl down, like in the photo on the left, and sometimes they'll curl slightly up, like in the photo on the right. Um, in certain cases, hemp russet mite feeding can be pretty severe. So this was an extreme case um, that this plant came with russet mites on it when I planted it in the field. But you can see um, how reduced in size it is compared to the plant right next to it. One note about this, though, there has been concern that you know, if um, this mite is present on a plant that it might easily disperse throughout the field due to it being so small and light and weight. Um, but based on my observations and reports from discussing with growers, that doesn't seem to be the case. So if you have a case where you've got russet mite on your plants outdoors, um, if you want to treat with chemicals, you could definitely spot treat that plant and it's not, you don't have to worry about it spreading throughout the field as easily. Um, again, like I showed you that one picture of the really small plant, this is a photo of a plant that was really loaded with russet mites. Um, the takeaway is that feeding doesn't absolutely kill a plant, but it can definitely lead to a drastic decrease in bud density, which is still lowering the yield and lowering the potential of having, if you're trying to sell this as a, a raw flower product, it's not, not really going to be possible. Um, to show you how small this mite is, this is under, let's see you, Catherine, I'm, I'll hurry up and wrap up. Um, this is under microscopy. Like I said, you can't see it with the naked eye. So you have to have microscopy in order to be able to diagnose its presence. Um, so to manage this, scout often, scout regularly. If you can afford it, invest in a microscope. And similar to um, the aphid situation, you want to quarantine or inspect your plants prior to introducing them to an indoor growing environment if that's how you're growing. Um, one last mite is the two-spotted spider mite. It's larger in size, so you can actually see it with the naked eye. You don't need microscopy here to diagnose its presence. 
Um, it causes this stippling appearance on leaves, and it can also cause uh, what we call webbing. Um, so you can kind of see it here. There's webbing on the top portion of this plant, and that's coming from the two-spotted spider mite um, heavy population density. So to manage these, um, you can use natural enemies that you can get from biological control companies um, and make sure you're inspecting your plants as always. So last one I will touch on is beneficial insects that are found in hemp. We all know what lady beetles are. Um, we'll see all life stages of these out in hemp, um, adults, pupae, and larvae. Um, as well as things like green lacewing adults and larvae and minute pirate bug adults. Um, as you can see with the lady beetle and the green lacewing larva, they have these really ferocious mandibles that they can come through and feed on soft bodied insects like some mites and aphids. Um, similar for the minute pirate bug, it has um, a probe for a mouth and it can come through and stab these soft bodied insects as well and help manage their populations. Uh, more photos of lady beetles and their eggs in the field. So I'm going to wrap up there. Most importantly, here's my email address. If you have any questions about anything, please feel, re please feel free to reach out. I'm here to help you. That's a favorite part of my job is helping growers. Um, additionally, if you're in California and you're growing hemp, please email me because I would love to work with you on some research opportunities. So thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Britt. That was so in-depth. You answered every IPM question imaginable. And Dr. Jones as well, you covered such breadth. And it's just really apparent that there are so many different issues to address when growing hemp. And there are so many ways to address them, which you both spoke to. And uh, Dr. Jones, as you had mentioned, there is no hemp 101. You know, there's, I think what we can take away from everything today is that there's no recipe for how to do this. So it really depends on trial and error and figuring out what works for your farm. So um, with that, let's move on to Paul Murdoch, who is going to tell us what he's found has worked specifically on his farm. So I'll turn it over to you, Paul. Okay, thank you. Can you uh, see my screen properly? Looks good. Okay. So I'm going to make this quick. In fact, I could make it really quick just by saying everything that the folks said prior to me is absolutely true in practice. Um, who we are is a boutique farm in Southern Oregon. We started very small and we're now 14 acres and we're actually diminishing, focusing on uh, quality. How did we get here? As mentioned, I had a personal experience breaking a leg which led to complications and we ended up finding uh, that CBD was so much better for pain control than opioids. And I think that's important because it gave a personal sort of uh, feel to it and a passion. And that really helps because farming is hard and you're gonna get to some uh, challenging moments. Uh, so somebody else previously said, start small. I can't advocate that enough. You learn so much in that first year, and yet you can still recover with just, uh, in our case, our family. Um, you learn about the pests, you learn about the plant, you learn about the process, you learn about the irrigation. And basically from that point on, it's just scaling that, uh, those learnings up to a larger size. But I would hate to go into this without having that first year of a, essentially a, a garden on steroids. It's, it's so beneficial. So after year one, where we had just 270 plants, uh, we began expanding. Uh, and along the way, learning, experimenting, inventing uh, new pieces of equipment. This is a transplanter we fabricated out of a trailer and some welding, uh, some, some metal wheels. Uh, and again, the learning along the way and the seeking out of help from folks like Gordon at the Extension Office and the conventional uh, agriculture support businesses uh, was just absolutely critical. So what did that early part uh, teach us and, and what are we doing now? Um, as, as has been said in many 
presentations, it's hands-on every day, scouting. Uh, uh, you've got to be in the field. You cannot just plant it and leave it and walk away. If you're not in the field, you can easily lose control of weeds or uh, insects or a variety of other challenges, pythium and those sorts of things. And I've found that growing a crop, especially growing a organic crop uh, with organic principles, it's like ste uh, steering a huge container ship. You need to make the adjustments very early, otherwise things get way out of control quickly. Uh, so we, our season is basically an irrigation strategy, weed control, IPM and disease control, uh, and then the last part of the season is uh, seek and destroy missions for males and hermaphrodites, and then harvesting and drying. Whoops. Uh, so one thing that we did, make sure I'm on the right slide. One thing that we did was we, uh, we brought all our drying rooms on site, and that was absolutely critical uh, because uh, as somebody said, you got to get the plant in the dryer very quickly. Um, and we're able to do hot laps, which has improved our labor usage. It's just much more efficient and less chaotic. Um, we put in some hops dryers, which help us when we are doing biomass. We just adapted uh, hops technology. We, we buck the flower, the flower goes in the top. Over 24 hours, it drops down three layers. Uh, and is nice uniformly dried. We don't do that uh, as much anymore because the demand for biomass is so much less than flour. So we really rely upon our large drying rooms and we did purchase two more this year. So we have four total. Uh, in the beginning, I, uh, so proven genetics, there's no point in growing a crop if you're gonna grow a bunch of males or a bunch of questionable uh, uh, plants. So choose your genetics wisely. We've partnered with Oregon CBD and we've stuck with them uh, because they deliver such quality um, and we have branched out. And this year we tried one new provider. Uh, we have three total and that new provider's genetics uh, threw out so many hermaphrodites that we just pulled the entire crop uh, plant that we planted of their uh, materials. Um, patrol every day, just walk it every day. I just do a cruise with a cup of coffee and it, uh, it helps so much. Uh, mulch, I hate plastic, uh, but weeds get the best of me. So we use a biodegradable starch-based plastic. And that's not a, a free get out of jail ticket uh, because there's still gonna be weeds along the periphery as you see in this slide here. Uh, this is purslane, which is um, edible and it's actually very tasty, but we don't want it there. Uh, th then you see on this slide, this is what it's like if you let the grasses get too uh, uh, exuberant. So we bought a hand tractor that we mow and till or roto harrow, power harrow through those smaller fields and then or smaller uh, rows. And then what we've done this year is we've gone to 10 foot wide rows. We're looking at quality, we don't need the uh, density. And this allows us to not only drive tractors and sprayers wherever we want to, but also to get in there and really inspect for males and hermaphrodites. Irrigation, uh, just touching on that briefly, um, our system is automated to where I can select the rows or the zones that we're watering. Uh, we have three inch mains coming up on risers, which uh, reach out to blue lay flat and then the, uh, the uh, drip tape is running off of that. We do run a filter uh, because we're pulling from a pond. Uh, and the other thing I will say about a filter is that it will cause you problems if and when using organic fertilizer, often because there's a lot of sediment. We use uh, pressure control drip tape, which is very helpful in dispersing your water load throughout your field and not just concentrating it uh, close to the riser, close to where the water pressure is highest. Um, but you can clog those emitters if you don't, uh, if you don't weed out the or get rid of the sediment. Um, our water schedule currently is completely 
off because we're having a drought and we're trucking in every drop of water that we use. Uh, but we are basically at as much as we can do, which is about 2,000 gallons per acre uh, every other day. Um, and that's a lot of work to get to that level. Um, that the volume of water when we do have a free uh, water supply it really depends on the plant size and the weather conditions. And then we feed wise organic uh, throughout the year and then change that towards the end, uh, uh, depending on conditions and needs. So the spraying program, the, the, this topic of corn earworm is very, very near and dear to me because uh, this morning I was spraying and I'm, as soon as we leave here, I'm gonna go spray. Uh, corner earworm has shown up uh, uh, in good numbers or bad numbers, depending on your perspective. And uh, we are, um, just like the, the speaker prior to me, using a combination of Gemstar LC, which is that polyhedrous virus, I believe, in combination with Centauri, which is a bacillus thuringiensis. Um, and, and as Gordon has said to me, uh, it needs to be the sub, or it's more effective as a subspecies Aizawe, or if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, versus Kirstaki. Um, uh, the Kirstaki seems to be more common, uh, but we are now combining both of those uh, along with a spreader like Brandt 719 to get it to penetrate into the flower. Uh, for aphids, which is our other concern, we don't haven't had them show up yet, but we like to be proactive with the ladybugs and lacewings and then responsive with some uh, direct treatments, impede and venerit. So this is what I used this morning. I just snapped a picture of it. The Brandt spreader is really important because the Gemstar uh, tends to penetrate a little bit uh, better into the flower. Uh, but it still needs the spreader to get it in there. Uh, the Zentari stands, tends to stay on the outside, um, so that's not as effective for the larger worms which have already made their way into your flower. The other issue that we deal with here uh, uh, significantly is botrytis, gray mold, bud rot. Um, we talked a little bit about direct seeding prior, or the panel did. I think the other benefit to direct seeding is that the, the, the plants that I direct seed are so much more uh, resistant to, all, to insect damage, to disease, to pythium, uh, but particularly Stark was their resistance to botrytis. I don't know the mechanism by which that is happening, uh, but my direct seeded plants with a better root infrastructure just don't succumb as quickly. Uh, or if at all, we've had them like one row is direct seeded, nothing. The next row is not direct seeded, it was transplanted and it's really full of botrytis. This was particularly true a couple of years ago. Uh, the responsive uh, when we first see, or actually before the first rains is we will spray Bacillus subtilis and we spray two runoff. I've in, included a couple pictures of our secret weapon, which is this uh, three-point mounted beast of a sprayer. Uh, it's a SEMA 55. And my only complaint about this sprayer is that it will knock down the weaker plants because it is just a, a powerhouse. It shoots, shoots material 90 feet out. And because you need to, to uh, spray to drenching on these materials, it's very important. Um, the passive IPM I'll touch on just briefly, and that is that we plant a lot of uh, additional flowers. Um, we do uh, beetle banks. Uh, we have a, a ditch down the middle of our field, which we plant with grasses and sedges that harbor these beneficials, um, which, and it's really fun to uh, have a beer at the end of the day and in the sunset, watch the beneficials going out to do, go do their work. Uh, it's like having uh, free labor. So we harbor those, give them something else to, uh, to eat and just try to maintain the biodiversity. The last thing is that even if you uh, are good with your genetics, um, you will have males. Uh, typically we'll get maybe three per 10,000 true males. 
but the, the much greater threat are the hermaphrodites. And it takes a really uh, close watch. So we as a family go out every night uh, and sometimes the crew goes out during the day and just walks fields and it's a, it's a meditation and uh, we find them and we, we get rid of them because they really diminish your crop value. Uh, and as I said, we removed 800 of one genetic strain due, due to excess hermaphrodites. Don't know why that happened. All the plants uh, are experiencing the same stress from water, we assume, uh, but that was significant. The last thing I would say is just that you know, the farming is tough and what's next for us is uh, legislation and market changes. We seem to have at least one ed existential crisis per year. Uh, and this year, uh, in, in addition to the drought, the one I see on the horizon is, are these things I can't impact? So getting involved with your uh, organizations, industry organizations is so important. So we have a common voice. And uh, I've included my email here. You can send me questions. Um, Catherine, I hope I brought it back to close to time and uh, I'll leave it at that. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Paul. It really is so helpful to see these practices actually on the ground and to get the details of what issues you're dealing with and how you're dealing with them. Um, so thank you for the details you provided. Things like knowing what kind of sprayer to use, that's hugely important. Um, I know we have a lot of questions, so maybe we can dedicate about 10, 10 minutes to questions um, and then we'll wrap it up. Rex, what questions do we have for hey. three panelists? Well, we have a few questions, not as many as the uh, first section, um, but uh, we have a question from Martine, one of my our co-workers. Um, are there any diseases to be aware of? And I know you had touched on that. Um, on that, um, but I think on the eastern side of the country, uh, not much was said about the disease problem, and um, and I think uh, that product, the Bacillus subtilis product, that is not for earworms or uh, European corn borer. That's a that's a uh, it's a fungicide. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a plant pathologist, but I'll say there's definitely a lot of uh, diseases that are present in hemp, definitely a lot in the east because it's more humid there, um, but still not exempt from him, from them out here on, in the west, but um, there's a lot. Yeah, the bud rot thing that can be several species, um, there's southern blight, um, a lot. Yeah, Paul, go ahead. <laughs> you want to say something? Well, the, the, the ones that we deal with uh, are to a degree self-imposed pythium, uh, which by over exuberant watering, especially in combination with the mulch, um, you know, that, that's an issue for us. Um, the bud rot, the botrytis, uh, yes, you are correct, Rex, that is the, the bacillus subtilis is in, uh, directed towards that. And that, I, you know, you guys tell me, that, that seems to be a free form available uh, spore that that uh, blooms under the right conditions. And uh, so I think it's just there to begin with. And when we had uh, two Septembers ago, hard rain, warm sun, hard rain, warm sun, it just bloomed and, and destroyed many, many crops for the folks that were not ready to dry immediately and resulted in some real uh, challenging human tragedies for a bunch of first year farmers. Yeah, we had, uh, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to mention two more that I, um, that we've been doing a little bit of a disease survey uh, in Oregon this year, trying to get out and about and figure out what is present and uh, would agree that we see some pythium uh, issues sort of early mid season. This is like a vascular wilt where otherwise like, okay, looking plants like one day will fall over and you look at that vascular tissue and see that there is some discoloration and something growing in there. Um, the Botrytis or uh, bud rot, for sure, particularly like fingers crossed for dry fall is to my mind, the biggest like piece of that puzzle. And then there are a couple of viruses that are on our radar. The two that, um, that, that come to mind are beet curly top virus and that we see uh, quite a bit in central and Eastern Oregon and is vectored around by the, by the hopper that uh, Katie mentioned. And then also uh, 
hop latent viroid. And I can't tell you what a viroid is other than a virus. I think it's smaller, um, but can cause stunting, leaf curling, and we see it sometimes, but exactly like what the full story is on those is a little puzzling. I was at some plants that I was like pretty sure were beet curly top virus two weeks ago and was maybe like the first sighting of that we had seen in that part of the valley. Took some cuttings, sent them for genetic testing. Uh, both plants looked the same to my eye. Neither had beet curly top virus. One came back with hop latent viroid and the other was negative for the test. And so there is more work to be done. And if you know a good hemp virologist, send me the, send them my <laughs> way. Um, yeah, there are a dime a dozen. Um, I, have um, a, I have a quick comment. Uh, yeah. I don't mean to step on the second session, but I just dropped a link in the chat um, for a good resource from my colleague, Dr. Nicole Gauthier. She's done an awful lot with uh, different hemp diseases, uh, specifically here in Kentucky, but but also, you know, sort of in the greater Midwest region. So uh, some of that's probably applicable uh, to things going on on the West Coast, too. I'll shut up. <laughs> no, I think, it, yeah. No, I was going to say that's good. Nicole really knows her stuff. She's done a lot. So utilize her in that link for sure. So, Paul, I'm really glad you brought up kind of habitat because uh, I, I work a lot in kind of the IPM habitat arena. And um, one thing about the corn earworm, you know, um, in order to there's no, and especially in organics, there's no silver bullets at all. Everything is just kind of increasing environmental pressure against a particular critter uh, or reducing environmental, you know, like providing habitat um, for a particular beneficial or suite of beneficials. But um, I would suggest um, maybe putting up some bat boxes to help reduce the adult corn earworm and European corn borer uh, adult populations because, you know, the moths come out at night, that's when they do their over, over position. Bats are predators at night and that's when they uh, kind of do their munching on, on critters. And, and most of the bats that are probably likely in Oregon, uh, you know, major insectivores, they probably eat about half their weight in insects every night. So. Just it's a great idea. And we, we do have owl boxes up uh, and it would be interesting to complement that with bat boxes. Yeah. And RCS cost share. Habitat structures. Um, let me see. Uh, and Paul, I had a question on your fertigation because uh, you're using probably uh, some fish emulsion products or things along those lines. Do you fertigate is where your injection is before or after the filter? Um, well, our, our, our irrigation specialist brought the injection in before the filter because ultimately you have to filter it. If you're filtering, or I mean, if you are, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. So it injects it and then goes through the filter and then goes out to the main lines because even if it's organic sediment or other sediment, uh, um, you know, rocks and things, it's still going to plug your, plug your emitters. Um, so, you know, I feel kind of ambivalent because I put all this money into, uh, you buy these organic totes of fertilizer, and then you end up just changing your filter frequently. Is, is the good stuff getting out there or not? I don't know. Um, right. But yeah. it, it's a challenge. And we did see in year one, and we, when we did that, uh, that uh, tuition grow of 300 plants, um, we plugged all of our emitters and uh, learned the hard way. So I'm, I'm really keen on keeping those things clean, at least to the end of the year. You know, there was some research done at UC uh, Santa Cruz on strawberries. Um, and they found that uh, that fish emulsion type of um, fertilizers, uh, when you put them through the filters, a lot of the nitrogen hangs out in the filter and doesn't reach yeah. the plant. So yeah, good, something good to be aware of. Good to know. So we're really, I'm taking a look this year a lot more at the emitter sizes of the pressure controlled drip tape and the filters that are available just to make sure we're using the right stuff and getting as much as, as we can out to the plant. 
Okay. Um, you know, just at the end of last session, um, um, Lady Ashlyn asked, is it possible to make your own personal hemp products with your leftover stuff you couldn't sell? And I think um, a lot of folks probably have literally tons of leftover stuff. Um, yeah, you bet. I mean, absolutely. I, I, that's how we started our, um, our hemp business was, you know, using our own personal stuff. The, the issue is volume. We've got so much of it, you know, but people can grow their own. People can, uh, can find a farm that's got excess, but it, the potency has remained very high, even when stored. Ah, interesting. I was uh, in my Googling this morning to find you some newspaper articles on the oversupply. There was one that I came across that um, was saying that um, uh, Charlotte's Web, the company that sell, sells some um, sort of like medicinal products um, that, are, that are made out of uh, cannabinoids, uh, in order to like meet their, I think they said $97 million market, they would need about 60 acres of hemp. Wow. And so, um, yes, you you can use that leftover material for own use. Like game on, like get your tinctures out, start taking your gummies, because you can produce a lot more than you as an individual or a family can can consume. Mm -hmm. Good point. And um, Katie, I have a question for you because uh, hemp is a new product. Uh, there may do you run across very many. Uh, insecticides or even fungicides that are actually registered for use on hemp? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, it has been a real challenge um, with insecticides and what's actually legal to apply to hemp. So a lot of the biological products that I talked about today and that Paul mentioned as well in his management regime, um, the, a lot of the companies that market these biological insecticides have actually taken the steps to get hemp on that label. So it is legal to use those products on hemp. Um, more of the conventional products are not going to be allowed. Um, and it gets tricky too. I think a misconception is that anything that's OMRI labeled or OMRI certified, which means it can be used in organic production, um, it's often assumed that just because a product has the OMRI label, it means that it can be applied to hemp. And that's definitely not the case. There are some, I, there are some chemicals that are organic approved um, that actually work really well to manage pests in hemp, but it's not legal to use those products because the label language is too restrictive. Um, and try not to bore you too much, but it really comes down to label language. Um, a lot of these labels have a set list of crops and a set list of pests, and you can't break those rules. But then there are some labels where there's kind of gray area, where it has a list of crops, but it'll say including these crops, but not limited to, you know, dot, dot, dot. So that's kind of like, well, it doesn't prohibit use on hemp. Um, it's not explicitly saying you can use it either. So that's a very gray area that's kind of tough to work through. But a lot of the biological ones, like I was talking about, actually do have hemp on the label. So that has been a, a positive step for us. Okay. To be continued, I guess. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, oh, yes. Well, I was just going to say, I dropped Oregon's list of uh, the Department of Agriculture provides a list, and I read this list as not prohibited uh, from use on it, just in the way that Katie was describing it. Like, yeah. You're not prohibited from using them. It is not that they are labeled for, though in some cases, and I guess a minor chunk of the cases, they are labeled for him. Um, this is our list. Whenever we like hear somebody talking about what you might try to use, the next thing to do is look at this list and say, may I? Um, yep, and so. Great yeah. resource, that's a great resource. And Paul, I have a question because I, I'm, I'm not clear on um, what is your market and who does the processing of your crops? Uh, good question. We're as vertical as we can uh, be. We sell, we have uh, uh, wholesale resellers across the country and internationally. And then we also have a website which is direct to consumer. We partner with a local organically certified extractor. Uh, guy who does a great job. If that was your 
question. Yep. And yeah. then the processing of the material. So we get oil back from him and have it uh, uh, turned into distillate and tea-free distillate. Mm -hmm. And we use that to make our products. We like to have our products made from our oil um, and cultivar specific. Uh, as people are finding certain cultivars with certain terpene profiles work best for them. Um, but that was just so critical, I think, for us was to find those partners, as was said many times and is absolutely true. You can have all the contracts before harvest that you want. And the only ones that are going to get executed are those that favor the buyer, uh, because if they favor the seller too much, they probably won't get executed. Mm -hmm. Good points. Um, Catherine, I think we're maybe a little bit over or we are a little bit over. So thanks everyone for sticking around, but I'm, I'm glad that you did stick around because we just covered such breadth today and this has been absolutely amazing. I really want to thank our panelists. It is truly remarkable to have so much passion and expertise in one virtual space. And if we were in person, there would be a resounding applause at this moment. So yes, thank you. And Catherine, do you want to mention the next two? Yes, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I just want to remind everyone to stay in touch. Um, you know, again, we have a lot of resources on our website, and you can reach out to us at any time if you have a question about growing hemp sustainably. I won't be able to answer it personally, but Mike definitely will, and we'll be able to point you in the right direction. Um, so these are again, again, this is our, our email addresses and our website and the numbers that you can call. And uh, we also do have two more webinars in this series. Uh, let me see if I can get my PowerPoint to work. Uh, so save the dates. Our next one is gonna be October 7th, same time from 11 a.m. to 1.30 Pacific time. And we're gonna be going kind of we're doing a deep dive again, but this time it'll be into harvesting, processing, and marketing, which is tough, and how to navigate contracts as well. And then on November 4th, uh, it's again going to be a Thursday at 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., and we'll cover HEMS regulatory climate. We'll focus specifically on California and Oregon, but we're also going to cover the federal regula regulatory climate and uh, crop insurance options and also some environmental externalities, both positive and, and, and negative. So make sure that you save the dates for that. Um, we'll have calendar invites coming out soon. So be sure to just check our website. If you're not subscribed to our newsletter, you can subscribe. Um, and again, thank you so much to all of, to everyone for attending and for all the questions that you brought to the table. It's been a really dynamic discussion and I am just blown away by how much I learned today. So again, thank you to everyone and uh, we hope to see you next time. Yeah, you guys rock. And Catherine, you rock too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks. you, and Kat. This was fun. Thank you all. Thanks, Great. everyone. Thanks, Catherine. This was fun. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Rex. <laughs> Thank you. So great. Take care.